Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we open our Planning and Development Committee meeting, uh, I would like to just uh, read the Pembroke Land Acknowledgement Statement. As we gather today, I would respectfully acknowledge on behalf of Council and the community that the City of Pembroke resides on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We thank the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. It is with this statement that we honour and respect the Algonquins on whose land we do reside. I will now open this uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting and call it to order. Uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Chair, in respect to 8I, as uh, our office is involved in that particular subdivision. Thank you. Uh, the bearer has declared a conflict on 8I. And we'll uh, be leaving the, uh, the table, I presume, uh, Your Worship. Any other uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Approval and or amendment of the meeting agenda. Prior to the approval, I just, uh, I may want to, uh, under new business, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one item will be removed at this time, which will be the Community Improvement Plan request of 794 River Road. It's being deferred to another time. If there are no other changes. I uh, propose that uh, a move by Councillor Plummer, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Those in favor of approving the agenda? Carried. Thank you very much. The approval of the minutes of the Planning and Development Committee of May 2nd, 2023, having been distributed and read. Are there any errors or missions? Seeing none, moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Any business arising from the previous minutes? Seeing none, we'll proceed. Uh, presentations. The Pembroke Curling Club this evening. Councillor Lafernier. There seems to be some conf confusion. We're not sure why this is on this agenda. I do know that the Curling Centre had requested appearing before Council a while back, but this was a surprise to me, and I was out of town last week. Um, they're not sure why it's on this agenda. I know okay. they wanted to appear. I believe they applied for a strategic partnership, and they wanted to appear before Council before that actually came. It didn't make budget this year, I don't believe. So um, I'm gonna send out my apologies, but I'm not sure where the confusion came in. Okay. This should have been on an agenda right. two months ago. <laughs> so they will not be appearing this they evening? They will be obviously. not here tonight. Uh, will they be appearing at another time? Uh, uh, possibly, okay. I'm hoping, because uh, there is some things they, they should be bringing forth to this council. Uh, yeah. I don't wanna talk too much about it. I'm right now the v vice president of the club but I will not be as of this Thursday. So maybe then I could speak on it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, we have an introduction of a guest this evening by uh, Councillor Troy Purcell. So we'd like to ask our visitor to come up and welcome to the Council Chambers. Councillor Purcell, would you do the honours of introducing our guest? I most definitely will. Thank you, Councillor Jack Doe. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as the Governance Committee Chair uh, for the Renfrew County District Health Unit, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Morgenstern, uh, Renfrew County's new Medical Officer of Health. Um, Jason has been formally appointed by the Minister of Health just a few short weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> Jason is a well-qualified and committed uh, public health physician who grew up in Renfrew County. He previously worked at the Halton Region Public Health, where his portfolio included health protection, disease surveillance, and emergency preparedness. Jason's university training includes a Bachelor of Science from the University of Guelph, an MD from Western University in London, a Master's of Public Health from McMaster University, and medical residency training at McMaster University. He is a Public Health and Preventative Medicine Specialist and a Fellow of the Royal College of the Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Additionally, Jason has published in peer-reviewed scientific journals and presented at conferences focusing on artificial, artificial intelligence in public health practice. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Morgan Stern, as I know he will provide excellent public health leadership to Renfrew County District Health Unit organization, their health and social service partners, and the residents of Renfrew County and District. Welcome, Dr. Morgan Stern. Welcome to our uh, committee, Dr. Morgan Stern. We're pleased to have you. 
perhaps you can enlighten us on some of the things that are happening or that your expectations, et cetera. Uh, sure, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Purcell, for that really uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I just wanted to say I, I'm uh, very excited and thrilled to be here um, about two months into the job so far. Uh, so it's, uh, this is uh, you know, a dream come true for me to be the medical officer of health here, uh, given you know, I've always wanted to uh, practice in a rural area, but then not only that, but a place where I, I still have a lot of family around, so on a personal level, uh, that's, uh, that's been uh, really uh, great for me. Um, so you know, at this stage in the game, I, I'd say my, my focus is still very much on listening and learning and uh, you know, meeting, meeting people uh, to ensure that uh, you know, I can be effective uh, going forward. So uh, getting to know the health unit, better understanding all of the unique health issues here. Um, but I'd say there's a few things that are pretty clear at the moment. Um, you know, we, we've all heard about uh, something called COVID-19. So um, we're op cautiously optimistic about the you know, coming months and, and years that uh, we'll be able to continue to, di to direct you know, more resources to other uh, you know, aspects of what the health unit does in terms of uh, preventive medicine um, and uh, you know, not stop just focusing so, mu so much resources on COVID-19. And so there's a lot that's been uh, left behind and some of that work has already been underway and the staff have been doing excellent work on it like uh, school aged children and getting their vaccinations up to date. So that's very much a focus for us. And then as well as mental health and early childhood development and really reinvigorating a lot of our health promotion programming that we hadn't been able to do as much of during the pandemic. So those are some of the things that I'm really excited about and just want to say thank you for having me here for this opportunity and looking forward to some fruitful collaborations going forward so that we can you know, continue to support the health of the residents of Pembroke and the surrounding areas of Renfrew County and District. So thanks. Any questions of Dr. Morgenstern from members of council? Council Fernier? Just a comment. Welcome home. Welcome home. Um, I just hosted the Civic and Youth Awards last night, and a couple of the young ones were saying, oh, they're going away, and they're hoping to come back. You know, one's going to be a nurse, one's going to be an RN. I'm like, come on home. <laughs> so welcome back, and we're really happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Dr. Morgenstern, uh, for me, from the chair, I know your predecessor uh, had some uh, tremendous challenges, and he handled them most capably and I'm sure that uh, you know you will fill his shoes very well. Uh, I know from the vaccination center we had at the Pembroke Memorial Center it was like a military operation it was just so precise and so well uh, coordinated and I have a son who lives in Ottawa it wasn't that way at all it was mass pandemonium so it speaks to the quality of uh, people that we have working in the area and I know that uh, you'll do an excellent job as well so Welcome to the community, and we hope that you uh, you stay here for a long time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Our next order of business, uh, members of council, we have. Uh, the visitor information uh, sign, uh, Ms. Seabart is reporting on that. Welcome, Angela. Good evening. So seeking committee direction on the Transcan Park visitor information sign at 2 International Drive tonight. Following concerns raised from the business owner at 2 International Drive, City Council is looking for options to move, remove, or relocate the vi existing visitor information sign on Paul Martin Drive. At its last meeting earlier in May, the Pembroke Economic Development Advisory Committee, PDAC, came up with, with the recommendation that the sign is not Mr. Kenny's and that it stay where it is and be used for one purpose. The majority agreed that this purpose would be as a tourism information sign rather than a locator sign for businesses in Transcan Park. After staff presented options for directing visitors to the hotels, PDAC recommended the tourist information sign be erected on the east side of Paul Martin Drive in front of the Irving Big Stop to direct people to the Best Western and Holiday Inn for tourist information. Further, that another tourist information sign be located along Pembroke Street, coming in from the east, directing people to the Heritage Centre and Clarion Hotel for tourist information. 
The recommendation from Pembroke Tourism and Culture Advisory Committee, uh, PTAC or PTCAC, is that the Transcan Park visitor information sign remains where it is at Two International Drive. If Mr. Kenny would like to take the large question mark off, uh, we'll take the large question mark visitor information text and listing of hotels off of the sign, then he is required to pay that cost to the city and the city will have the information taken off of the sign and leave it blank until the city can look into planning and budgeting for a new sign next year, possibly exploring an electronic option. Um, so these were the, the recommendations that, were ca that came up um, as a result of both uh, meetings of those uh, two advisory committees. So the financial implications from the PDAC recommendation, um, we've obtained a quote from Speed Pro Signs to put new tourism graphics on the sign on both sides and that would equal $3,550. And the PTCAC, the Tourism Advisory Committee app recommendation, um, the cost to the city would be zero dollars. Um, the owner of O'Kenny's um, in, that, in that recommendation would be responsible for paying the city to remove the graphics from the sign. And that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Plummer. So this sign is, uh, came up before the last council and uh, the gentleman has a business there and it's caused quite uh, the issue with the business. And I've heard both sides of the situation and uh, he's trying to run a business. Uh, his, uh, he's expanded it with tourism down the Muscat River. He has uh, a great uh, tenant there, great fish and chips, Norkies. And uh, I know the history of the sign. I know that the sign had the uh, community futures there before, and they were listed on the sign. And then when the tenant took over, his business wasn't put on the sign. I know we're trying to advertise the, uh, the uh, Transcan Corporate Park, but um, I went to see uh, Mr. Kenny a couple of weeks ago. We went over and looked at the sign. And... Uh, the bottom line is the sign is, is a deterrent to his business. And, uh, you know, he would like the sign removed, and, and I agree with him. As far as uh, relocating that, that sign or some type of sign to advertise Transcan Corporate Park, it could be put uh, over on the other side where the Best Western is. He said that they didn't have an issue with moving the sign over there. But that's neither here nor there for tonight's conversation. I'm going to make a motion to uh, remove the sign. It's, it's on two metal stands. So I motion to uh, remove the sign and uh, put no sign there so that his business is clearly visible. And on his property, he can put a proper sign. I hope I get a seconder. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor, moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Keel. We have further discussion. Councillor Plummer, Councillor Purcell, and <coughs> Councillor Keel. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Unrod, did you have Yeah, that? through you to the chair. I just wanted to, uh, uh, um, I guess, not, not question the motion, but just to kind of clarify the motion in regards to the cost um, to remove the sign. Would that be borne by the city or by uh, the owner, Mr. O'Kenny? Uh, the city. Get the front end loader in there and take the sign out and uh, let's start fresh and he can do his promotion and we can work on proper signage for Transcan Corporate Park. Councillor Plummer, Purcell. I would actually work. yield my time to the seconder if the motion is being changed. I think the seconder needs to agree to that motion prior to my Is comments. there agreement on the city absorbing the cost of the removal? Can I query Mr. Unruh on sure. if he has an estimated cost of just picking and moving? Yeah, no, I don't. I know that we, there was some discussions in the past in regards to the cost to remove. Uh, I, I, I don't think it'll be as easy as, as picking and removing um, because there's probably some concrete in there and stuff like that. So that would have to be removed and, th and things like that. But um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that the total cost, but. 
Councilor Kale, you have the floor. So, Mr. Kale, you just want to pay some. Yeah, I think Mr. Kenny said he was going to pay a thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we, do we have a confirmation from Mr. Kennedy? Uh, Kenny, to the, I mean, what you say and what actually happens isn't always the way things so, transpire. And I'm not questioning his his, his capability to pay. It's just, uh, you know, we're making some uh, financial uh, decisions here based on maybe. Mr. Onra, do you have any? No, oh, I, I have no uh, ad additional information. Um, in in regards to that, but I'll like like I, I, unless we leave the the cost to be determined, but, but it's then that's if I would provide mark. a suggestion to the to the committee here, um, if Mr. Kenny had agreed to a thousand dollars in principle, then why not you make your your motion to then uh, Mr. Kenny to pay a thousand dollars in the city to pay the rest or pick up you know that way i'm sure being in construction it's not going to cost more than a few thousand dollars to remove a sign um as a rental of a, even if rental of a loader and some men and equipment you know you're you're going to be well under a few you know well so, perhaps based so on I, on that information perhaps we could vote on the particular motion if it's defeated we'll come in with a new motion well i'd like to amend my motion to say mr kenny contributes a thousand dollars Okay, towards removal of the sign. Does the seconder agree to that? Okay, so the Mr. Kennedy would uh, agree to $1,000 in offsetting the cost, yeah. and the city would pick up the balance. We have further discussion on the motion. At, no, I didn't finish yet, Sorry, actually. go ahead. So I, I would actually, I'm in agreement. I think it's um, it's been a deterrent or been a bit of a thorn in our side here for a few years. The sign, it's as once the information booth or the information center has moved or non-existent anymore, it provides some, you know, certainly some confusion on Mr. Kenny's business. I think even entering the city, uh, typically you enter on the, you know, we drive on the right-hand side, so signs technically should normally be on the right to provide information to the driver. You don't want to want to be looking across the road and trying to look on the other side of traffic to figure out, oh, am I turn left right here? So I think moving the sign in the future, a new sign on the Irving side to direct people to Trans Canada Corporate Park is a good idea. Obviously, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, so, but I am in full agreement just to remove the sign for now in front of Mr. Kenny's to allow him to properly advertise for his business and not have confusion. Thank you. Councillor uh, Purcell, His Worship, and Councillor Fournier. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I agree. I think that it is a bit of a distraction in regards to his business. Uh, that sign is confusing uh, for uh, people entering the city, um, especially looking for information purposes and um, also, you know, being directed to to, to Kenny's uh, business, and I think it's uh, an opportunity for us to uh, put this to, be to bed. Uh, it's been what three plus years um, to remove a simple little sign. Um, so I think it's time that we remove the sign, um, start fresh, uh, look at other opportunities to promote the Transcan Park, um, either with you know enhanced signing on the correct side of the road, as, as Councillor. Um, uh, Plumber had had spoke to, um, so I do agree to that, and I, I do like the idea of Mr. Kenny putting in the thousand uh, dollars, and that the city of Pembroke absorbing the rest of the cost for the removal of the sign. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and then Councillor Fournier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I won't be supporting the motion. I sit on both advisory committees. Mr. Lapier attended both advisory committees to give us a. Uh, a backdrop as to the history of this particular item when two international drive was sold um, I uh, was around the table as well being uh, uh, reminded by mr. Uh, uh, mr. Lapier of the history that the agreement of purchase and sale was legally drafted was very thorough as he described it um, it did not include the sign mr. Kenny then and I still have screenshots of mr. Kenny saying some quite negative things about our staff um, effectively being uh, misled that sort of thing um, so then we fast forward to uh, the recent meeting wherein uh, mr. Kenny made various comments they included that the hotels are directing people's people to his business for tourist information 
as well that um, the hotels didn't want to be in the visitor information business any longer. Um, I don't often do this, but I took it upon myself to contact both hotels to have a conversation with them about the sign, to have a conversation about this comment uh, that they are referring individuals to his business for visitor information. I was told that uh, it's highly unlikely that they were being referred to his business for tourist information in part because their employees wouldn't have ever known it as a visitor information centre in terms of how long they've been with those, uh, those two businesses. We're talking about the Best Western and the Holiday Inn Express. When I asked them about the sign uh, being a question mark and directing to uh, their sandwich board signs with the question marks, they valued the, uh, the uh, and wanted to continue to be visitor information uh, um, centers, if you will. Um, and I recognize it's not all roses. I recognize that in the visitor, uh, sorry, in the hotels, do they have elaborate visitor information sections? No. Can they do a better job? Sure. Uh, and I recognize then moving forward, we have the Heritage Center that is also a strategic partner and a uh, has the same question mark because uh, directing individuals to get information from there. I know that our PBIA, which is separate than this, but the PBIA is looking at trying to do something different in terms of information that did come up at the Tourist Information Advisory Committee and got uh, tabled to, uh, to keep it separate from this particular item. When I go to this particular location, I don't see what the confusion is. If this committee does proceed to tear down the sign, that's great. I'll still be looking next year to have budgeted an electronic sign at the exact same location to provide information to direct people into our downtown and direct them to the visitor information center. But it will be, I will be proposing the exact same location because it draws people's attention. This is what's going on. So if, if at the end of the day, the, the concept is, well, it's interfering with my business and so forth, forth um, I don't see that he could uh, he could as mr. Lapier said uh, erect his own sign to indicate right now he has a, a portable sign if you will uh, he could put up something a little bit more elaborate to direct people into his business so in any event to uh, keep it short I, I don't uh, support the particular motion thank you your worship councillor Fernier thank you um, so I I've met with mr. Kenny a couple of times as councillor a uh, deputy mayor has um, my original take on it was move the sign to the other corner. However, it doesn't make sense at all because if you're turning onto that road, you don't look on the other side. Anyway, my, my concern here is we have two city committees with volunteers sitting on these committees that we went to to discuss this at length, and they did, certainly. The PDAC and the, uh, the Tourism and Culture Committee. They came out with these recommendations, not just off the top of their head, but they came out debating it with common sense and without a politician's hat on. They looked at it from the city's perspective of expense and precedent setting. If we start moving signs that disturb other businesses, are we going to pay? And this could cost the city quite a bit. I imagine there's wiring there that has to be removed, that kind of thing. So I guess that's the worry that came out of these meetings part of it. Um, also, we, uh, PDAC felt we need that sign there because it is TransCan Park and we should probably do something fancier with it. So I guess my concern is when Mr. Kenny came, his big problem was the question mark. He really didn't have a problem with the sign, it seemed, except for the question mark because he feels that it's directing people to his location because they think it's the welcome center. So to my way of thinking, this recommendation that is coming forward from these two committees is certainly acceptable because if we get rid of the question mark, does it not get rid of that perception that he is the welcome center? So I mean, I'm just saying that we're taking the value away from these committees if we're not going to consider what they're recommending with real thought. Um, I certainly understand Mr. Kenny, but then I don't know if we change the sign. Maybe he wants to put his name on the sign. I mean, maybe that would help. Um, I mean, I understand what his concerns were with the question mark, but the sign does belong to the city. I'd, I'd like to know how much is it going to cost to move. I mean, are we willing what, if they come back and say it's going to cost five thousand dollars to remove that sign and all the wiring and then to resod that section? I don't know. Um, I just worry about precedent setting because. That was another concern that came out of the committees. 
Deputy Mayor and Councillor Plummer. Uh, the other issue with the sign is there's a liability. The snowmobile hit the sign this winter. So the way people cross at Irving and the, this person ran into the sign. Um, I asked Mr. Kenny if uh, the uh, question mark was removed in the hotels. I sent him a text and I, I stroked out the question mark in the hotel signs with the, and I said we keep Transcan and he said that you know he'd rather have the sign removed and I feel that um, I respect the committees you know we're, we're not always going to agree um, I still feel that the sign should be taken down and that's my uh, that's my that's how, what I feel and you know I've listened to both sides and remove the sign and go from there Mr. Plummer. Thank you, Chair. I, I think we're still following a bit of the spirit of the committee. I say they did, they did recommend removing everything off the sign and just leaving it blank. So at that point, you just have a, have a blank sign that's really not doing anything at, the, at that point. You know, then we're going to have to figure out what we want to put on that sign. I, I understand the, uh, I still agree with the Deputy Mayor in the sense that removing the sign, there could be an option, though, here, uh, listen to the Mayor's comments, that you know, maybe there's a future way to make it sign better in the future. Do we need to remove the concrete? Do we need to take all the wiring out? Why not, as you say, if it's just bolted on a few bolts, why not remove the sign for this year? Then we can take it away, rethink what we're doing next year in budget. Do we really need a sign there? Do we need something different? Do we need an electronic sign? Do we need, is O'Kenny going to make a, put money towards a big sign that has his name on it? We can share the sign. You know, there's many things that possibilities we can think about. I think for this one, to, in the spirit of not costing X amount of dollars unknown, simply unbolting a stand, freestanding sign and removing that section, leaving the concrete and leaving the wiring, just cap it, um, I think is certainly acceptable uh, for, this, uh, for this term. And come back next budget, in the budget next year, and we can all discuss this around the table again of what kind of sign we really want there. So I will still continue to uh, support the motion of removing the sign. Further discussion, if not, I'll give the last comment to the mover. If you have anything else to comment on, Deputy Mayor, and then we will uh, take the vote. No, I have, I have no further comment. Thank you, then I'll, uh, Councillor Fournier. Um, I'll be supporting it only because um, I agree with Councillor Plummer. Let's not take all of it in case we want to put an electronic sign there someday or something, and, and we can look at it at budgets, but I really want to make sure Mr. Kenny's willing to contribute something to the removal of the sign. Thank you. So the flavor of the motion is that the, uh, the rampart, the, the major part of the sign will be removed, but the concrete and the wiring will remain for future, uh, future use in case we decide to do something. Is that correct? Does all accounts agree with that? that that's the way we're going to go? Can I just add one more comment? Go ahead. At the discretion of the chair. I'll allow uh, it. Go ahead. Uh, that's fine, but uh, Mr. Kenny informed me, in his opinion, this, the location of the sign is in violation of the site triangular uh, condition of the city sign bylaw. So I would like that to be checked out also in future, future reference. Your Worship. Well, just in respect to that, so Ms. Sorno is in the room, perhaps we can just simply ask. You're going to answer. Ms. Sorio. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, no, it's not in the site triangle. Um, I looked at the site triangle for his particular property. It's located on city property, so it's not located with on his property or within the site triangle. And then there is a site triangle for our property. Um, and it's not located within our site triangle in our property. So I, I think we have to be cautious. When people are making comments, we have to be armed with the proper information. But based on the, uh, the motion that's on the floor right now, just to clarify that the sign itself will be removed, Mr. Kenny will proceed to donate or to share cost share at $1,000. The city will take up the balance of the cost, leaving the main concrete rampart there with the electrical wiring. Is that the flavor of the motion? I will call the question. Those in favor? Those against? The motion passes unanimously. 
and we look at next year's budget for alternates. Thank you. Yes. So the Community Improvement Panel recommends that $5,000 be granted to Michael Conroy, owner of 259 Pembroke Street East, for the Community Improvement Plan's facade improvement grant. On May 29, 2023, the Community Improvement Panel met to review the facade improvement grant application received from Michael Conroy, owner of 259 Pembroke Street East. The application is for the facade improvement grant. The, application, the applicant plans to replace the existing front door with a commercial, new commercial aluminum door to improve its appearance. The facade improvement grant is designed to encourage aesthetic improvements to buildings and properties. This grant is for properties that are not located in the Pembroke business improvement area. These aesthetic improvements include brickwork, masonry, wood and metal cladding, and tablature, eaves, and other archite architectural details. And other improvements covered under this grant include windows and doors, signage in accordance with bylaw, exterior lighting, awnings, marquees, and canopies, professional fees, and replacement of historical elements. According to the community improvement plan requirements, there are to be no outstanding work orders and taxes against the property. According to the fire department, there are no orders on file for this property. It was also confirmed with the Treasury Department that there are no outstanding taxes. There are also no open permits with the building department. According to the attached low quotes, $11,980 plus HST will be spent on the facade improvements at 259 Pembroke Street East. Based on the facade improvement grant, requirement, grant guidelines, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $5,000. Therefore, this applicant is eligible for $5,000 under the facade improvement grant. For the regular community improvement grants, $110,000 is in the 2023 budget, $25,832.09 has been paid, and $59,574.09 is committed. A total of $50,425.91 remains available. Thank you. For uh, Councillor Kale. I move that we accept the recommendation and award the grant as stated. Moved by Councillor Kiel. We have a seconder, seconded by Councillor Lafernier. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, next item uh, has been deferred. Uh, we'll go on to item D, asset naming policy, Ms. Sorio. Good evening. A request has been made uh, from Melissa Beavis, who's the white wife of the late John Beavis, asking for committee to consider naming a street in the city of Pembroke after her husband. The Planning and Development Committee at their meeting of March 7th uh, tabled this request until an asset naming policy could be reviewed by this committee. So based on this direction, the following policy has been created for your consideration. So the purpose of the policy is it serves as a method of commemorative recognition to honor events and individuals, outstanding achievements, distinctive service, or significant community contributions. The purpose of the policy is to provide guidance on the criteria and process for naming of city assets. Um, city assets under the definitions would include streets, buildings and external building features, recreational trails or pathways and parks and park features. So we're looking for um, several outcomes with this policy and one is a standardized approach and a consistent evaluation framework for naming city assets. A matrix rating system is attached um, to Schedule A and a continued uh, legacy for naming of the city assets after outstanding individuals, events and natural features which reflect a positive image for the city and reflect the history, contribution, accomplishments, and diversity of the city, its communities, and citizenry. Another outcome would be the compilation of a centralized commemorative names reserve list for future asset naming opportunities. So the general requirements would be that all city assets identified, like streets, buildings, trails, uh, pathways, could be named. 
um, an administrative name can be applied to a city asset unless a commemorative name is recommended, such as the pollution control plant uh, would be the administrative name and then if it was to be renamed something else. Council shall approve all commemorative names before they're added to the city's commemorative names reserve list. The public are welcomed and encouraged to suggest potential names for city assets by submitting a letter with an explanation of how the proposed name complies with the naming principles in this policy. Suggestions for names in honors of, of individuals must be accompanied by a written biography of the individual, including a description of the individual's significant contribution and an explanation of why the honor should be given. This will be kept on file and reviewed as opportunities arise. Where a person's name is being considered, it would be the city preference to consider the names of persons who are retired and or deceased and therefore no longer active in their fields to minimize the potential for controversy. And where possible, a direct relationship should exist between the individual or group and the feature park, street or facility being considered for naming. Notice and public uh, consultation shall be undertaken in accordance uh, with the asset being named and in consultation with council and the public consultation period would be 20 days. So for there would be a selection criteria and this is kind this is um, goes hand in hand with the matrix that forms part of this um, particular um, policy and the preference would be to have a direct relationship with the asset asset portray a strong positive image of the city recognize the geographic historical historical, cultural, indigenous, or sig social significance of the area, reflect unique geographical or physical characteristics of the asset site or area. They are in keeping with the specific theme and highlights and promotes activities and industries that are or were prevalent in Pembroke. Uh, historic groups of people or recognized association, recognizing the contribution of organizations, honoring the significant contribution of an individual to the community and reflecting the diversity of various communities and citizenry contributing to the ethic, ethnic, social and economic well-being of the city and other selection criteria as deemed appropriate by council. So if you're going to use people's names then it should be limited to persons that have made a significant contribution to the municipality as, contribute, as demonstrated excellence, courage, or exceptional service to the citizens of Pembroke, the province, or Canada, or the world, put themselves in harm's way through military service, City of Pembroke's Fire Service, or OPP, or previously the Pembroke Police Services, shall have extraordinary community service record, work to foster inclusion, equality, and reduce discrimination, promote Pembroke to the world, and have demonstrated themselves as a, a recognizable uh, figure. So um, assets once named should not normally be renamed. Council may consider renaming an asset on an exceptional basis when new information regarding the effectiveness of that asset name becomes apparent. So there could be a, um, a naming um, ceremony and a plaque if the, uh, the if council does approve the renaming of a of a um, of an asset so if a commemorative plaque is to be installed there would be a cost associated with the purchase of the plaque and the installation and so i'm looking for direction regarding this policy this evening councillor keel miss sorrow you have outdone yourself that is an amazing policy um i think it's uh i think it certainly opens up uh more doors than we had with the street the future street naming uh, uh, policy which I think was the only one that we had at the time um, I read through this this is uh, um, I mean it, it shows you you need to make a contribution um, not everyone is is going to get their name on a plaque but for those distinguished uh, Pembroke residents of which we have had many um, I think this uh, there's nothing I would change in this policy and then when it, uh, so I would be happy to have you bring it, uh, bring it back before council. And, uh, and then once we have the policy in place, um, I would certainly love to see uh, staff uh, uh, consult with the Beavis family and move that uh, particular matter uh, forward. I don't think there's a need for a motion or anything. I think this is more guidance. So that would be my uh, guidance. Thank you. Councillor Plummer. I would agree with Councillor Keel on this one. It's a very well-written policy. 
matrix to you know kind of determine how to you know you need some sort of metrics to measure. Uh, it's hot, it's tough to judge people on, on, on just uh, how you contribute to the, to the community. That's a tough one. That's for sure. Uh, you know everyone contributes in their own way, and certainly uh, feels that you know certainly uh, passing a family member is tough, and we want to you know, remember them and have them remembered uh, for all the things that they did. Uh, so you know having some way to release rate. Um, if that person has, uh, it's tough if you don't want to say contribute enough, but the word is uh, as a sense to, oh, my mic is on. Yeah. Go ahead. Everyone's crouching around. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I just to, to say that. Is that whole thing over? I don't know. I don't know if that's holding over. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I will be short then. It's a great policy. I look forward to being brought forward. Thank you. Uh, well said, Councillor Palmer. Councillor Fernier. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, so I just have a question. Um, as the names come forward, such as the name we just received, it, we, we would put it through this matrix, matrix to, to basically give it a level or a grade. It would go then on the list, or are we going to look at the list before we start, you know, because there is a list. <laughs> so are we going to look at the list? That's what I want to, like, um, through you, the list would be all the existing city buildings. Um, it would be um, the parks, um, and I mean, you know, there may not be a need or a want to rename the parks. I'm not sure, uh, but I can provide that list um, on June 20th. So I guess the question I want to know is: We have a list of names waiting. Am I right? Oh, that Are was we for going streets. To Oh, that was for streets. Okay. That's okay. A, it's, it's only a street inventory name, and m maybe what we do is we just get rid of that inventory list and start a new one. Mm -hmm. um, so if people are interested in in this um, asset naming, then they can come forward. Right. Um, and then if there's nothing at the point, like for a street, let's just say, then we put that on the list if it if it makes the matrix and it you know and it's and right. make, and council is in favor of it then we put it on the reserve list the commemorative list okay. um, that we've talked about Good. so that way we can start building that list that's right so i would just say that the names list that we have for the streets though i would caution if we received a name a year or two ago i, I don't think we would start maybe we should look at a, a year but we can discuss that at a later meeting of when to wipe it do you know what i mean Okay. Okay. I, I can bring it forward and you yeah. can look at it and say. And what year that came in and that kind of yeah. thing. I think that's a good idea. Thank you very much. Councillor Plummer, in all fairness, do you have a short pricey? The, I mean, you were cut off electronically there. Oh, I don't know how much uh, was actually uh, picked up on the mic. I guess I had a faulty mic here. So I was just, uh, uh, again, uh, commenting on the the difficulty it is sometimes to rate someone's significance that they've contributed to uh, the town as, uh, you know, as a, being a family member uh, of a pa having a passing of a family member that uh, certainly no one wants to judge their family member on being I was more important than someone else. So at least we do have a rating system say that they meet the criteria to uh, I think that's a good word that, uh, you know, to be put on the list. So I know that this council will debate it in a future date. So I do acknowledge that uh, it is uh, a great uh, I look forward to the policy and uh, seeing some names brought forward in the future. Thank you. Further, uh, Councillor Purcell. <clears throat> just getting back to the street naming, um, would it not be beneficial just to kind of quickly go through the list and identify the criteria that you have listed here using the weighting matrix? I think that might be the best way to do it. And then kind of see, okay, um, which ones would kind of rank high. Uh, and then you know, resolve the list that way. So that way, you know, we don't just kind of eliminate the list and start fresh. I think that'd be the best way to do it. And I think just looking at the criteria that you have you have here in terms of the weighting, I think it'd be pretty, pretty self-evident in regards to, you know, the scores in terms of the significance based on, you know, the criteria that you have identified under the matrix. So I think that's probably yeah. the safest approach yeah. and probably would make more sense. And yeah. I, I know it's a short list. So yeah, it through you, well. Mr. Chairman. And it, there, I know that there'll be some wiped right off the list because yeah. they're names of trees and things like that. Correct. So I don't think that we were, we're going to go that way. Yeah, so. just the names of uh, you know prominent individuals yep. or individuals that contributed to sure. the city of Pembroke. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there? If not, uh, Ms. Soriel, uh, you have uh, Councillor's flavor for 
uh, your policy, which is well done, so you'll be coming back with that. Thank you. Next item, PBIA art project request, Ms. Sorio. Okay, so it's recommended that the committee approve the PBIA request subject to city staff being satisfied that all outdoor art galleries at Shamrock Park and Coronation Park are placed appropriately to ensure maximum protection for the users and visitors of these spaces. A bylaw and encroachment agreement will be prepared for the next council meeting based on the committee's direction. So a request was received by the PBIA to create a community art project for the summer and fall of 2023. The risk request is to transform areas in the downtown core to an outdoor art gallery. They originally wanted um, vacant property owned by the city at 252 to 270 Pembroke Street West, which is between Royal um, Tax and uh, Vogue Cleaners. Um, the PBIA requested the city staff to provide mulch, lot cleanup, uh, grass cutting, garbage removal. But this space has many tripping hazards if you've, if you've walked by it. Like there's still foundation pieces that are sticking out of the ground. And so we felt that this could be a major liability. And further, that uh, when I checked with city staff, um, they didn't have the resources to provide the assistance required by the PBIA for this particular lot. Um, so this information was presented to the PBIA and they've now requested the use of the Coronation Park, which is right across from here in Shamrock, Park, which is across from uh, Ulrex. Um, and um, they would uh, use these to display the art. So the art, the display would consist of plywood boards that people could paint. And the aim is to have this art gallery, which would encourage visitors to come to the downtown. So if it's approved in principle, an encroachment agreement with the city would be entered into to permit the gallery and consultation with city staff would be required for each of these locations to ensure that the plywood pieces are secure in place so they're not going to take off in the wind or be stolen or anything like that as well as providing a safe space for visitors for these outdoor galleries the encroachment agreement would indicate that these outdoor galleries would not have any impact negative impact with respect to pedestrian safety accessibility emergency services maintenance or private accesses and the agreement would save the harmless the city from any actions or claims arising from the said encroachment. And there would be no costs associated with the uh, city. All would be borne, all costs would be borne by the PBIA. Councilor, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Fallon. Thank you, that's fine. Um, so the PBIA, uh, the director and uh, the owner of the Little Cannon Company, Stacey Taylor, attended a recent uh, OBIA conference and uh, came back with this idea that uh, another community similar to Pembroke had this outdoor art gallery they presented at the last council meeting. And uh, they've, come, they've come up with a uh, very, uh, a very good uh, promotion package for sponsorship to, kind of, to recoup, recoup some of the costs. And I was talking to uh, Ms. Taylor the other day and she was indicating that some residents have come forward to uh, want to do some painting. So it's very good. And the, lo the two locations are great. So I'd make a motion that we, uh, uh, that we um, accept uh, the recommendation from committee. Moved by Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Plummer, you had your hand up. Are you seconding the motion? I would second the motion, yes. Seconded by Councillor Plummer. Discussion, and Councillor Fernier. I was just going to second it. Okay, any further discussion? I was just uh, going to say what a unique idea brought forth by the PBIA. Uh, good for them to attending a conference and bringing back some unique ideas. Uh, really shows that uh, you know we have a good uh, organization going out and really finding ideas, bringing it back to Pembroke to show some unique, uh, some uniqueness here in town. I think it'll really be a nice, interesting draw. Certainly, I've not seen one uh, an outdoor art gallery before, um, so I'm looking forward to it. Very well. Uh you know, in, in Salisbury, uh, on the plains of Salisbury in England, you've got all these rocks in a circle called Stonehenge, and people come from all over the world to see a bunch of stones. So I'm sure they're going to come and see some unique art that's uh, displayed here. I think it's a great draw for the community. So we have a motion on the floor. Those in favor of, of accepting. Those against, carry unanimously. Thank you. Proposed amendment to taxi and limousine bylaw, uh, Ms. Sorio. 
Um, so I'm seeking committee direction this evening. Um, recently, staff has been asked to review the taxi and limousine bylaws with the aim of deregulating and opening the market to competition. Um, the city has a taxi bylaw in place, and this existing bylaw requires the city to license taxi drivers and taxi cabs. And as part of the licensing requirements for drivers, uh, the bylaw enforcement officers uh, must ensure that they possess a valid driver's license. They're over 19 years old. They're not found guilty of an indictable offense. Uh, they're not found guilty of an offense, criminal offense or sexual offense within the preceding three years and that they have not accumulated more than seven demerit points under the Highway Traffic Act. So therefore, um, a taxi driver license, to, to license a taxi driver would include um, a current valid Class G driver's license, um, a police record check, an acceptable statement of driving record, a signed declaration by the applicant confirming that they don't have any outstanding criminal charges or warrants, a letter from the taxi cab company that they're going to be employed with stating that they intend to hire the applicant, payment of fees, so for a new taxi uh, cab license, it's uh, $75 for a taxi driver, and then two passport style photos and any other documents deemed necessary by the bylaw. So once the license is issued, then they have to renew, the taxi driver has to renew this license annually. And then at that time, we have to do another statement of driving record. Um, and police check is, re record check is required every three years. The annual fee and the annual fee is another $75. And if there's any late fees, the, um, they would have to pay those. And then two more passport photos. So the taxi uh, bylaw also requires the taxi cab owners to license the taxi cabs. So the bylaw limits the number of cabs to 24 and presently we have 13 um, cabs. So to license a cab, the bylaw requires that evidence that the vehicle is licensed under the Ontario Highway Traffic Act, that the vehicle is mechanically fit, um, that there is evidence of insurance and there's insurance for the owner and driver with a minimum two million dollar liability. So the uh, bylaw, our present ta by taxi bylaw lists the driver prohibitions and duties, vehicle equipment and maintenance, vehicle inspections, meter maintenance, proper fares, um, revocation of licenses. They're all duties of the city's Pembroke bylaw enforcement officers to ensure that are um, completed. Um, and they deal also with complaints regarding the state of cabs or the conduct of the drivers. There is also a bylaw to establish rules and regulations for the um, licensing and operation of limousines within the city of Pembroke. And this bylaw is very similar to the taxi bylaw, which requires licensing of the limousine driver and the limousine itself. Um, and we haven't had any licensing of limousines in a very long time, not that I can remember anyway. So. Um, so the licenses for the taxi cab owners and drivers as well as for the cabs themselves is very onerous and time consuming for staff. However, if the licensing component was eliminated, the city would have no knowledge of the drivers or the owners of the cabs or the state of their vehicles. So the fee for a taxi cab and limousine owner license is $500 and that annual renewal fee is $200. Um, a new taxi cab and licensed driver a license is $75 with an annual fee of 75 an annual renewal fee of $75 and then the fee for um, uh, on that sorry and that's the limousine and taxi cab so based on this uh, your direction is required whether you want to continue with the taxi bylaw or do you want to take out the licensing requirements and I believe Councillor Keel has more information I think Councillor, I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Plummer had his hand up. Councillor Purcell, Councillor Keel. Okay, I'll, uh, <coughs> as stated uh, through yourself, uh, Ms. Sorio, the process is onerous, uh, it's licensing these cabs. Uh, I'm not even sure how much staff time or you can even judge of what that would cost us in staff time to produce this only charging $75 per cab. <laughs> by, by your straight look and head shake, I see, I see it's not quite covering the fee and time that it takes to even license these vehicles. Um, it's a tough question to get out, you know, completely deregulate something and just let it be open 
you know, to the wild west or open season for anyone to jump in a cab and call themselves a cab company. But I think there may be a way to streamline this. Is there not, you know, could we not come back and say, what is the minimum safety requirement we're asking for? At least a copy of a driver's license. Do they have insurance? A safety on their vehicle? Is, you know, is there not just something we can just, two or three things we say, yes, we, we recognize a the person, they have a driver's license, then they have insurance in their vehicle, their vehicle's been safetyed, we deem that, that we've done our due diligence and say, yes, that cab can work within the city of Pembroke. So I'm certainly in favor of um, kicking it back to staff in this sense and coming back and what really they can bring back and say, what is the bare minimum that we can look at and as a council say, yes, we've done something due diligence and say, we are licensing the cabs, but we're not going through this onerous process that is costing us staff time and uh, just basically bogging down the system. And then, then it opens up to other markets saying that if, if someone wanted to come in and have their own ride share program or something in that late, we could look at that and have something in the city. Thanks. Councilor Purcell, Councilor Keel. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I echo with uh, Councilor um, Plummer um, stated in regards to maybe having some sort of indication in terms of who's operating taxis within our community. Um, but I do believe in deregulation and I know uh, this past week I probably utilized the $75 of your time just to look at um, you know, concerns in regards to a cab that may not be mechanically fit. Um, so that was a, a concern of a, of a resident that I brought forward. Um, really, there's no recourse for the city, um, and under the Municipal Act, there's no requirement for us to license taxi cabs within our city. Um, we can under the Municipal Act, but it's not a requirement. So I'm in favor of opening up um, to Uber, Lyft, uh, other type of rideshare platforms, um, you know, um, eliminating uh, a majority of this policy uh, in terms of this bylaw other than maybe just a registration process. So we have uh, just an indication in terms of um, who is actually driving uh, uh, and operating cabs within our, 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 uh, our city. Um, so um, I, I would agree in terms of deregulation. I think it's just, uh, we've got enough on our plate and it's time to get back to the basics and do the things that we're responsible for very well. And uh, the things that we don't have control over, or we can't enforce, um, then, you know, these are the things that I think that we need to look at and uh, see if we can relinquish some of those responsibilities if they're no longer required or valued. Thank you. Councillor Kale. I'm going to try and go quick, but I have lots of thoughts on this particular, uh, on this particular, these two particular bylaws. Um, number one, I do think, the, um, having spoken with staff, um, including one of our bylaw officers and, and you, Ms. Sorrell, this, this takes up a lot of time. And it does not strike me to be a good use um, of our of our our planner and our our bylaw enforcement. Um, the one thing that hasn't been mentioned is most of this bylaw actually falls on our CAO, um, unless he's delegated. I don't know if he has. But uh, uh, when you read through the bylaw, it's the CAO approves this and the CAO does this. Our CAO has far more important things to do than a taxi bylaw. Um, the one thing that we learn time and time again is government regulation doesn't always make for better results and it certainly doesn't make things cheaper. When I was on the campaign trail, transit was a, was a fairly large topic this time around. And um, I know the deputy mayor and, uh, is, is looking at certain transit options. Um, I took this to Ms. Sorrell because I, I want to look, while well, the deputy mayor is, is handling the, the transit bus side of things, I wanted us to also be looking at other things. So the one thing that this bylaw, the taxi bylaw says, is when you get in the taxi, it's 550. There's no, there's no negotiating that. Every taxi has to charge 550. So even if there was a taxi out there that thought, you know what, I'm going to, uh, um, I'm just going to offer flat, or sorry, it's 550 plus then the rate um, for stoppage and mileage. If there was a taxi driver out there that said, you know what, I'm going to do $10 flat fees. That's how I'm going to compete against all of my operators. No matter where you go in Pembroke, to, you can't do that under this current bylaw. Um, so for you to go get groceries, it's $5.50 to get in the cab to go, $5.50 to get in the cab to get back. 
eleven dollars and the and the vehicle hasn't even moved yet. Um, so that's what I'm saying is maybe there's maybe if we opened it up to other forms of competition, somebody would would using flat fees or different uh, um, or even different mileage, um, a person with a flat fee wouldn't have to have uh, um, a mileage system in his car. Those are not cheap. Those to have those systems installed in each car, um, they then have to. Uh, our staff also checks to make sure that they're calibrated. Um, if we move to a flat fee, if a company moved to a flat fee system, they wouldn't even necessarily have to have a meter. So there are so many aspects to this bylaw that is telling taxis how they need to operate and at what fee they have to charge. We've actually taken the competition out of it. If another cab company, if Councillor Lafrenier and I this weekend wanted to start a cab company, we're charging the same thing as everybody else. We can't, there's no competition. There's no trying to lower the price um, by offering different ways. Um, technically under this bylaw, if I wanted to offer a, um, you know, use my, use my cab company 10 times, get an 11th ride free anywhere in town, technically that 11th free ride would be illegal because they're supposed to charge you the 550 plus the mileage when you get in the car. So I think there's lots of things that we can carve out of this. Um, I know, or at least I think I know where a lot of it was going and that was the safety of our residents. When it comes to the, the vehicles themselves, and Ms. Sorrell, I, I don't want your department to take this the wrong way, but factually speaking, we found out last year that the MTO came in, despite the taxi uh, companies giving, handing in their, their appropriate paperwork, well, the MTO came in and went, no, no, they're not good fit, they're not fit for the road. Um, and I'm not saying that that's a black eye on the city of Pembroke, I'm saying that that shows you that some of the added regulation is not making for safer vehicles. Um, we talk about demerit points and we talk about, uh, you know, criminal code history or whatnot. Um, we cap it at three years. I got to be honest with you. My question would be, is one of our residents, if they knew that the taxi driver had a sexual offense three years and two months ago, going to feel any safer than knowing that they haven't had a sexual offense in three years? We have a court system that has probation aspects, they can take people's driver's licenses away from them. It's almost like we're second guessing the court on whether or not this person should be driving a taxi cab. We're second guessing the POA court on the demerit points about whether they should be driving a taxi cab. Um, and when it comes to safety, I'm guessing some of it is, you know, well, the person might be alone with this cab driver. Well, there's a lot of our seniors in that that are alone when they have an HVAC person come over or a plumber come over. Um, when you get picked up uh, uh, by one of our uh, car mechanics and they, they pick you, you know, you drop your vehicle off and they take you back to their work, uh, to your workplace uh, with a free lift, none of, our, none of our bylaws require them to have any of these onerous requirements. Um, and then the limousine bylaw, um, let's call a spade a spade, the limousine bylaw was brought in um, about a decade ago when Uber and Lyft and all those companies were coming in municipalities were taking quite a, uh, a distaste for the, uh, uh, for the ride share programs. I think at this point in time, a decade later, um, we've, we've seen from the larger cities uh, um, that those ride share programs, they're working, they're, they're competitive, they're often cheaper than the taxis. Um, so I, I think it's time for us to, uh, uh, to take a step back from that and there's, there's Honestly, so much more that I could say about this, but uh, I, I think we've overregulated. I think we've perhaps have a bylaw that's that's there just because we can. And uh, I'm going to echo Councillor Purcell and Councillor Plummer, um, and and say that I think we could take a step back. And I would note, as I did to Ms. Sorrell in the past, there's nothing stopping us from having basic requirements. So we could say we could have a bylaw that says. You shall not operate a taxi if you have a if you have a criminal code or whatnot. And instead of the licensing and providing proof in that, our bylaw enforcement people, if called, can always check in on someone and make sure they're following the law. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a licensing process um, at all. We could have set specific requirements that, if not met and if found out and investigated, we can still lay a charge. So there's. There's lots of ways that I think we can pair this back. 
But the goal, my goal, is to try and up, open up competition and try and uh, make things cheaper for our residents because for me, this all comes out, and I know the Deputy Mayor appreciates, um, having affordable transit in the City of Pembroke is very important and I just want us to be looking at every facet that we can to try and get that done. Sorry, Mr. Chair, that was longer than No, you're allowed 12 minutes. You're under your time 12 frame. Minutes. <laughs> 12 minutes. That's correct. Uh, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Sorio, there must be other municipalities that are concerned about safety uh, of their citizens in respect to transit that must be looking that they're roughly our size that they're trying to find uh, alternative uh, methods of doing transit when they don't have an actual transit system. Uh, as part of your research, did you come across uh, in preparing that report, did, did you come across other municipalities? What do they do? Do they have a middle of the road approach? Do they have no bylaw, um, a stringent bylaw? Can you comment on that? or? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I did look at uh, seven other municipalities. Um, a couple of them within the Renfrew County um, and then the town of Prescott. Uh, Brockville, Smith Falls, um, and all of them have a, a taxi bylaw. Um, now, how they're they're administered are different. Um, some are done by police services board, some are done by the clerk, and some are done by bylaw. But um, they all do have um, uh, a taxi bylaw, and they do have the similar requirements as we do. You know, um, a criminal reference check. Uh, you know, checking, uh, you know, driver records and things like that, so. If I may, from the chair, uh, a young student uh, that I knew attended uh, Nipissing University in North Bay, <clears throat> and of course students are limited for, you know, transportation costs, et cetera. Not all of them own a car. So I said to this particular uh, individual, what did you do for transportation? Because Nipissing's located, you know, on the uh, on the top of a mountain almost. He said we'd call Lou. I said, oh, who's Lou? Is he a cab driver? He said, no, Lou has a car, but he charges us five dollars each to go anywhere in North Bay. I said, that's great. I said, does Lou have a license? No. Does Lou have insurance? No. Lou has a car. Yes. So they would call them. Now, the, my question is liability. You know, I don't know what the liability is now presently with our cab drivers. I'm sure they're covered uh, to, to protect their, the individuals that they transport. And in defense a little bit of cab drivers and the bylaw, that bylaw protects the public. It may be more expensive to travel, but a lot of these drivers, they know their customer by name. They know the person has a handicap. I mean, they'll load groceries for them. I've seen that. They go over and above the requirement. I've seen them take groceries up two flights of stairs. Not a requirement. Uh, but I don't know if you'd get that with an Uber driver. Would he charge you for that? You know. So I'm just saying there's different, you know, there, there's different ways of looking at it. And this guy, Lou, we call Lou. If Lou has a car and no insurance and he's transporting, you know, somebody, Sure wouldn't want to see an accident with four or five young people in a vehicle of that nature, but just for, for some sober thought. Sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor. Oh, thank you, <clears throat> you Chair. So, uh, fully in favor of a uh, rideshare program for Pembroke. You and I have talked about it before. And uh, the <coughs> transit, uh, file we're moving forward. I was informed by the treasurer last week that it's being extended. The RFI, request for information, is being extended till the middle of uh, June because there's a company that has come forward wanted extension. So that, that's a separate issue. You, you can still have a public transit system and you have a taxi and a rideshare system. And in communities that I've researched, um, they're called transportation network company. So what we need to do is to um, increase the competition so that the fares are lower. Because one of the uh, students that helped us uh, with the rain barrels, she lives in the West End, and she told me that to go to Walmart and back, she paid $40, $38. And nothing against the cab companies. Cab companies do a great job. They will always be here. 
um, even if we do get public transit, the, the cabs have never gone into business. Um, I did some research when I was speaking with an actual uh, rideshare company today. I don't want to give their name out. Uh, it's not Uber or Lyft. Pembroke isn't big enough for Uber and Lyft. Four years ago, as I mentioned before, uh, Heather Sullivan and I, the former economic development officer, and I went to Toronto. We were at a conference there anyhow, and we met with Uber, and we uh, talked to them about making a proposal to Pembroke for the Innisfil model, where they have subsidized rides. And Innisfil went from $500,000 up to 800000 and they have 38,000 people, I think, 35, and uh, they limit their rides now to 30 return rides a month. So I, I don't think uh, if a ride share came to Pembroke, it, it, we, we would need to subsidize. This company is uh, set up out west. Uh, they're from uh, Ontario, the owner. They cater to small to medium markets like Pembroke. And they're just uh, they're, they're expanding into markets like ours. And the person I spoke to, the owner, said to me that you still have your taxi bylaw but what you do is you add an addendum to the rideshare uh, for the rideshare companies, the uh, transportation network company. And you sit down with staff and you work out a bylaw that is uh, cost and time effective. It's fair to everybody. And he said that as far as licenses go, um, he bought 13 from one small Ontario community. That's all they had left. And they're not, they're, they don't flood the market. They hire, they do the personal background checks. You still need the criminal and vulnerable sector checks. You still need the safety, a car 10 years or older. But um, the person I, I spoke to is interested in Pembroke. And uh, it's a possibility. And so any uh, taxi bylaw slash uh, transportation network company bylaw would have to be re redone at an addendum. That's what Peterborough did, and it has to be fair to everybody. Competition is good. Uh, the free market works, but it still needs to be regulated in certain cases. And this would supplement uh, the transportation in Pembroke if we had a rideshare program. So we're not going to get the Ubers or the Lyft, but we're certainly going to, we can attract a, a company. I spoke to one of them. Staff would have to check it out and, you know, work, work out the details. But... Um, it is possible to, for a rideshare program to come. I, I fully support that. We've talked about this. In addition to a transit system, especially with the college, um, you know, we did our focus group at the college, and they prefer public transit. But some of the students would Kate, would phone the rideshare program too. So, so going forward, um, we could, you know, we could give uh, direction to uh, the transit uh, committee to look into a possible rideshare program, if that was favorable towards you, uh, towards council, and come back and talk with staff and come back with a report. What is the wish of council? Councillor Plummer. Well, I think the, <clears throat> besides the Debbie's mayor comments, I think the, the general consensus, I think, on the table before your comments was their staff to go back and see how they can, uh, in later terms, gut the by current bylaw and uh, just figure out what minimum safety requirements that we would ask for, you know, just to basically know who's driving in our city and that sort of thing. Uh, I think the deputy mayor um, proposing some ri a ride share, I think that's a separate issue and not to be, well, similar, but also maybe not to be added to this one. I think we need to on the table right now is to talk about the taxi limousine, limousine bylaw. If we want to talk about ride share, I think that's for a date, a, another date. Councillor Purcell. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, if we just go back and pare down what we existing bylaw that we have, meeting the minimum safety requirements, um, and then bring it back to, to council, I think that would be appropriate. And then we can have a, a little bit more dialogue at a later date in regards to uh, uh, ride share and ride share services, but um, this way it'll pretty much take care of the taxi services, limiting services. Smith Soriel, do you understand the wish of council and you can bring back more information for us? So this was just for information tonight to make us aware of what is going on. Thank you. 
Next item, item H, proposed official plan amendment. Amendments, excuse me. Um, I think uh, there's a proposed amendment to site plan control bylaw. No, yes, AG, sorry. Yes, please. Yes, go yes. ahead. Thanks. Sorry, you okay. that one. Too many things on the item on the agenda here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, on October 25th, 2022, the province introduced uh, Bill 23, which is the More Homes Built Faster Act. And the goal of this act, again, is to increase housing supply to build 1.5 million homes in the next 10 years. So further to my report of January 3rd, 2023, there were changes to the site plan approval process. Um, the act removed exterior design as a consideration in the process and no longer requires developments of 10 or fewer residential units to receive site plan approval. The city's existing site plan bylaw established that development of three or more residential units is subject to site plan uh, approval. So now that the act has been passed, the city's site plan control bylaw must be amended to state 11 or more residential units is now subject to site plan agreement site plan agreements. So if the agreement, if there's agreement in principle, a bylaw will be prepared uh, for the next uh, council meeting. And just for your information, for smaller developments of 10 residential units or less, we have amended, um, the council has amended its uh, building bylaw to control grading of land in the absence of a site plan agreement. So. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Plummer? Uh, this is, uh, I think, just a housekeeping item as the province has dictated and we must follow the plan laid out. So um, if council around ahead nods, I think we'd just let Ms. Sorial uh, update the current bylaw. That's uh, consensus. Thank you, Ms. Sorial. Okay, Next item, proposed official plan amendments. Okay. Item H. So... In 2022, the provincial government introduced Bill 109. It's now the More Homes for Everyone Act, uh, 2022. And the, um, the Planning Act amendment um, that has received the much attention relates to the requirement that municipalities must refund planning fees on a graduated schedule over time up to 100% refund. If they fail to meet statutory deadlines for decisions on zoning bylaw amendments or combined zoning bylaw, official plan amendments, or site plan applications. These refund requirements will come into effect on force on July 1st, 2023. And as part of your um, report, um, there's a graduated refund uh, chart. So if decisions are not made within certain time periods, then we must refund them their uh, planning application fee. So the planning department is dependent on receiving comments from outside agencies, including MTO, uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs, utility companies on planning applications. Therefore, if the city doesn't receive these comments in a timely manner, it's gonna be us that suffers and that must refund the applicant. So the official plan includes a section on complete applications. And the planning department is proposing to amend the official plan to ensure that site plans are now included to ensure that the clock does not start ticking until a complete application is received and further that pre-consultation meetings are strongly recommended before application submission. So in order to address the risks of the city having to refund planning application fees, a change to when studies are reviewed is being proposed. And we've been slowly introducing this, so we're asking for studies now. So we have um, a proposal coming up uh, for rezoning, and they've already submitted a noise a study. Another proposal has already pro provided us with their parking study. So we're getting those up front so that we have a complete application to present and then we can meet those timelines once we have that complete application. So, but we have to add site plan agreements into the official plan as a complete application. It's not there right now, so that's why there's this amendment. So, uh, and most municipalities in Ontario are doing that uh, same direction. They're asking for the studies up front. Secondly, um, under Bill 13, which is Supporting People and Businesses Act, it brought in legislation that enables council 
by bylaw to delegate the authority to pass bylaws under Section 34 that are minor in nature to a committee of council or to an individual, um, an employee of the city. So these policies proposed in the official plan include establishing provisions to allow council to delegate, if it so chooses, it doesn't have to, the approval of um, holding, the removal of holding symbols and temporary use provisions. So to delegate the authority to pass bylaws on these matters, the Planning Act requires that the official plan provide policies to specify the types of bylaws that may be delegated. The proposed amendment would establish policies that enable council to delegate the authority to either remove the holding symbols or provide authorized temporary use. So even if council decides to amend the official plan to allow these delegation authorities it's just a policy in the official plan. A further bylaw would have to be passed, and that's not what's being presented now. It's just allowing that those policies to be in the official plan. Should council choose to delegate, then it's already in place, and it would just be a, a bylaw. Uh, the thirdly, uh, direction was provided by the operations committee at their meeting of April 18th, 2023, um, to change the city's affordable housing definition in the official plan and revise it to match the provincial definition. So our definition right now is it's 10% below average purchase price or rent is at below or, or is at or below the average market rent. Well, the More Homes Built Faster Act defines affordable as either rental or purchase. It's affordable if it's no greater than 80% of the average market. Uh, value. So that was a direction of this committee. So um, that would be um, in the official plan. And then finally, uh, the last official plan amendment uh, would be that the new act now requires official plans and zoning bylaws to permit second and third residential units as of right in detached, uh, in detached dwellings, semi-detached or townhouse dwellings. This does not require rezoning, nor do the neighbors have to be notified, and there is no appeal rights for these additional units. The city's existing official plan and zoning bylaw permit one accessory dwelling unit, um, and so we're looking to include that third unit. So there's four items that we would have to um, discuss. I don't know if you want to go through each one individually. So the first one would be that the definition of a complete application would now include site plan agreements and there would be a recommendation for pre-consultation meetings prior to planning application submissions. Comments on item one, uh, Councillor Keel, Councillor Purcell. I'm in favor of item one as well as the other three. Oh, okay, <laughs> that was good. Councillor Purcell. Um, just a quick question, um, probably like other municipalities, do you think that there's going to be a need for like um, SLAs with the Ministry of Transportation or utility companies just in terms of service time, turnaround times, um, service level agreements in place? Um, I think that's where we're probably headed to, so that way there upon notification, um, Ministry of Transport has X amount of days to provide us or provide um, the service. Um, I think that's probably a wise decision going forward if we feel or maybe just down the road if we feel that um, you know the refunds are being delayed and and just to add something through you mr. chairman the Ministry of the Transportation the provincial agencies they're on a different timeline than we are too <laughs> a lot longer I assume if it's you know it's costing you know municipalities dollars in terms of refund mm -hmm. dollars I think uh, you know it'd be an opportunity for them to uh, come to the table okay. Your worship Simply to say I concur with uh, Councillor Keel. I know that in respect to particularly the first one, they're on the news, there's different municipalities being interviewed when this bill came out, and they really pushed the pre-consultation part to try and meet the timelines. Um, but it, it all makes sense, so I'm good with it. Councillor Plummer. I would agree with uh, Councillor Keel that uh, the all the proposed amendments are, uh, are certainly a uh, a good idea and justified as uh, following the province uh, set of new mandates. And I would just highlight that I really like that we're following the new mandate for the affordable housing at 80% uh, of um, current market rate, not just uh, using the 
current rate at or below as being affordable. As we know, COVID has really increased rent uh, across the whole province. And now uh, with housing being shorter, we'd like to make sure that people are, are building affordable or actually really being called affordable housing. Thank you. Further comments, Deputy Mayor? No, I, I agree with all the, all the changes and I echo what Councillor Plummer said to, to get that. And you and I talked about this a year ago and I asked you what, uh, what's affordable in our official plan. You said it could be $10 below market rate. And uh, so it is in the, uh, in the act anyhow, but we're just echoing what the province has. So at least we have some credibility, you know, especially with uh, when we go with developers and if CMHC comes through with some money for our, our locality with developers, we can, you know, get the affordability in there. Thank you. Ariel, uh, do you, you need direction here? Is this just information for us or will uh, you be coming you. back? I will prepare a bylaw for June 20th. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Uh, His Worship has removed himself and declared a pecuniary interest on this item. Subdivision agreement request for the James W. LaPointe Motor Holdings and Corporation subdivision off Boundary Road, Ms. Sorrell. Okay, so the James W. LaPointe Motor Holdings Inc. plan of subdivision proposes 45 lots for single detached dwellings. The property received draft plan approval in 1998 and then in 1999, and then it was uh, amended again in 2019 under bylaw 2019-59. And the developer would like to begin constructing dwelling units um, in the fall, uh, the summer fall of 2023. The final stage of the subdivision process is in to enter into a subdivision agreement. So the subdivision agreement is looking at municipal servicing, sidewalks, roads, stormwater management, grading, and it's also looking at tree planting, when building permits can be issued, road assumptions. Um, so, and that's all dealt with in that subdivision agreement. So the combined committee in July of 2020 approved the use of a modified semi-urban cross-section standard for the subdivision, which means the subdivision will have ditches and underground storm sewers, and there will be no concrete curb and gutter. And this was approved since it matches the standards in the existing neighborhood. A draft subdivision agreement has been received and is being reviewed by staff. The drainage plans, the operations department has approved the drainage plans and servicing plans and are now working with, uh, now working towards staging and sequencing um, surface works for this subdivision. So it has been noted that part 41, and you'll note that you have a little diagram on your, um, as part of your package and it's the yellow piece, um, is, is owned by the city and it was part of the parkland dedication However, it's right in the middle of the road. It's part of the proposed roadway system, Eddy Crescent. So this part um, must be designated as a public highway, and then it will be assumed in the future by the city once the road meets the required standards. But there is a need for a bylaw to dedicate this part 41 as part of the road system. And further, parts 34 and 35 on that little diagram, and they're in the orange, it's not a very big piece, it's only about 10 square meters, but that's required for Ottawa River Power Corporation for an easement, hydro easement. So we would uh, have to pass a bylaw for that as well. So there are uh, no financial implications at this time. So um, a bylaw along with the subdivision agreement uh, will be before council at a future meeting subject to committee's uh, direction and again subject to committee's direction a second bylaw will be before council regarding um, the uh, Ottawa River power easement and dedicating part one as a part 41 as a public highway Councilor Kale um, Everything looks good to me um, especially with the last two. I mean obviously that's necessary and um, under the newer municipal act you can only designate a road via a bylaw so that's just necessary so um, I, I would certainly recommend that this committee uh, just proceed Councillor Plummer I would echo Councillor Keel's uh, comments in saying that this uh, I have no issue with what's proposed and uh, I would uh, direct staff to prepare a bylaw future date Ms. Sorrell is that piece of property the city owns classified as surplus land? It's, 
through you. Um, it is part of the, it was, it's always been part of that subdivision. So I would not say it's surplus land because it's, um, it was always part of the draft plan approval, that section. Thank you, just for clarification, thanks. So we're, uh, you'll forge ahead, bring back the appropriate information at the proper time. Thank you. No further questions or inquiries or queries from Council to Ms. Sorrell. If not, uh, yes, Councillor Keel. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Plummer. No further business before the assembly. We are adjourned. Thank you.
Welcome to our June 6 uh, Finance Committee meeting of Pembroke City Council. First item, uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof. Seeing none, approval of the, uh, the agenda. Moved by Councillor Keel, seconded Councillor Purcell. Those in favor? Carried. Item four, approval of the minutes of May 2nd, 2023. Moved by Mayor Gervais, seconded by Councillor Plummer. Those in favor? Carried. Uh, any business arising from the minutes? No, seeing none. Item six, new business. We welcome uh, Chief Sell, Pembroke Fire Department monthly report for May. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so with the uh, weather turning in uh, May, our uh, prevention efforts will focus on the downtown core. Uh, all buildings will be inspected uh, regardless of usage type. Uh, staff have uh, once again begun the uh, fun nights at the local schools. Uh, this year the first school was uh, Champlain Discovery and that was followed a week later by a presentation to the grade one classes at Champlain Discovery. Uh, we welcomed a small group of community living uh, uh, staff and clients into the fire hall for a tour. Uh, we conducted some fire extinguisher and fire safety training uh, with the Bernadette McCann House. So 20 individuals uh, from this group attended the training session. Staff also delivered the annual fire extinguisher training session to uh, 25 uh, of the city's summer <coughs> students. Public safety messaging for this month focused on emergency preparedness week and the importance of knowing the risks, developing an emergency kit and making a plan. Uh, messaging was delivered on Pembroke's Pure Country, My FM, and Your TV. Our partnership with the Renfrew County Fire Departments provided messaging in the Eganville Leader uh, covering cooking safety. And uh, our social media pages focused on emergency preparedness and emergency preparedness week. Uh, so our uh, employee recognition program for the uh, month of, uh, of May uh, was the first time we had co-winners. So I wanted to uh, highlight uh, Luke, uh, Firefighter Luke Dunn and Firefighter Emma Gibbon's efforts in uh, coordinating and developing a, uh, a framework for staff to effectively uh, manage traumatic, uh, the traumatic impacts and cope with the stress of critical incidents. Uh, this guideline uh, for operations will be Im implemented soon and uh, they did fantastic work on it. A lot of research went into this and uh, uh, I think they've developed a very good uh, guideline for our staff to follow. And our volunteer of the month was a volunteer firefighter, Derek Beaupre. Uh, Derek uh, selflessly filled in uh, for other uh, volunteers who were unable to uh, respond to calls to ensure that we uh, had the uh, appropriate uh, support. Uh, under courses and conferences, uh, staff attended the Ontario Association of Fire. Staff attended electric. Motors and uh, uh, the annual May mutual aid plans and implementation. Uh, work obviously, May is a busy month for emergency management, so emergency. Safe practice. This uh, which was be prepared. Approach from the wanted their own distinct theme. As a lead up to emergency preparedness, this emergency preparedness week in Pembroke. Focused on those that during their delivered people at the fire department or through the OSPCA. Uh, one thing, and and then followed up by that, uh, something to add about our EP week coinciding with the community expo at the PMC. Uh, that was a good opportunity for us to promote emergency preparedness. And one thing I did notice was 
Um, when including pets or, or introducing the idea of including pets into the emergency preparedness plan for families, it really, uh, it really sort of, I guess it maybe changed the messaging a little bit and people then uh, seemed, to, uh, seemed to ask more questions and then started thinking more about preparing for their own family and incorporating the pets. So it was a nice, um, it was a, the right time to introduce a new idea that, uh, that generated some thought, uh, which was good. And finally, as far as emergency management goes, um, staff attended the spring sector meeting for the capital sector. Uh, this meeting brings together uh, CEMCs from across the, uh, the capital sector uh, and discuss topics affecting the uh, communities. The EOC training room uh, held a, uh, a meeting between the councils of Laurentian Valley and the city of Pembroke. A week later, the EOC was used as a venue for the city of Pembroke and the county of Renfrew liaison meeting. And at the end of the month, the EOC held uh, staff training uh, on the topic of customer service. The administration of the fire department attended this training session as well. Uh, the room also hosted in-house training sessions uh, and meetings hosted by the department. The Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association assisted the Fellows Football Program with the purchase of a helmet in the month of May. Uh, and the association also donated to Muscular Dystrophy Canada. Uh, training, uh, in May the staff continued and completed the Resilient Minds training, which began in April. Uh, we also completed the second of uh, two of our large-scale water rescue training evolutions. Uh, staff attended a live burning training event in Petawawa. Uh, this event was organized by the Renfrew County Chiefs Association and utilized the mobile burn unit provided by the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, vehicles have been delivered to our training pad for, from AIM Res Recycling where each platoon completed extrication training. Uh, this training is uh, bringing together all of the uh, training throughout the year where they can go out and, and apply what they've learned with the tools to learn how the tools and the vehicles react under the uh, extrication process. Uh, the rest of the training is outlined uh, for the month. Uh, the number of inspections and consultations for uh, May was uh, 145. Uh, number of incidents attended uh, was 24 and uh, $0 loss. We have uh, three outsta outstanding fines as well. Thank you, Chief, for that detailed report. Uh, questions, uh, Councillor Purcell. Thank you for your report, Chief Sell. Um, just a couple um, comments. An employee recognition program, um, I think kudos really needs to go to those two firefighters that put on the critical incident stress management um, framework. Um, you know, that addresses any mental health issues associated with any critical incident or response. Um, as you're well aware, um, you know, um, ambulance services, health community, we talk about it on a regular basis in regards to WSAB costs as well. Um, these typically result in long absences for work are very costly for organizations. So, um, you know, the quicker that we can provide uh, support for mental health types of concerns for first responders, um, the better off not only the, 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 uh, the responder, their families, but uh, also um, your organization and the City of Pembroke. So, so thank you. So again, kudos to go out to Firefighter Dunn and Firefighter uh, uh, Gibbon uh, on that. Um, and the other one was is in regards to the um, stickers for, we, you know, we often never think about our poor pets that are left home after we you know, head off to work or off to various different places that we need to be. And by simply identifying um, you know, on your door uh, through a sticker that there, there's a pet. Um, and I know if your pets are, are more like my pet, they're a part of the family and uh, their loss would be a, a huge loss uh, for myself. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, I think this kind of coincides with the health unit. It's been funny we had the medical officer of health here tonight and one of the campaigns that they have in regards to animals is this to tie a yellow ribbon around a dog in the event to, if there's behavioral types of issues so people don't go up and approach the dog so to reduce dog bites. So that's you know another visual cue. So this cue helps to identify that there's a, a dog in the home and uh, if you see a, a yellow ribbon um, you know, on the dog, you know, ask the owner to approach it before you actually approach the dog to prevent bites. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. 
Uh, if I may, through you, Chair, uh, one thing that I would like to add about the uh, stickers is that I believe if you do go onto the OSPCA website, um, there may there is a, uh, a tab that you can uh, click on and fill out the information, and those stickers will be delivered to your home. Any other comments or questions on for the chief uh, for his report? No. Okay. Moving forward. Item 6B, bylaw to regulate recreational open air burning. Chief Sell. Uh, so, staff requests direction from committee uh, regarding the review of the city's current recreational burning bylaw. So, at the uh, committee meeting of May 2nd, 2023, committee express, expressed interest in reviewing the current bylaw 2020. 2020-21, a bylaw to regulate recreational open air burning and precautions to be taken by owner in the city of Pembroke. So uh, staff reached out to a number of municipalities, uh, both neighboring and from across the province, uh, and discussed uh, what they uh, have in, under their current bylaws. Uh, so the uh, cities that will be discussed uh, in this uh, report, Petawawa, Deep River, Renfrew, and Armprior. Uh, with Aurelia and Kingston being the other municipalities. Uh, the City of Toronto was consulted regarding the ceremonial and sacred fires only. So there's a number of similarities and differences between uh, all of these bylaws. Uh, number one, the City of Kingston has addressed ceremonial and sacred fires in their bylaw. Toronto's bylaw was also researched in respect as well. Uh, Kingston simply exempts these fires and encourages organizers to contact the fire department before and after the fire. Uh, Toronto has an actual form which organizers fill out and send to uh, Toronto Fire for acknowledgement. Uh, number two, uh, the current bylaw in use by the City of Pembroke is the only bylaw that has geographical boundaries stipulating where residents can attain, obtain a permit and have outdoor fires. Uh, the City of Kingston uh, employs two uh, zones uh, with certain types of fires permitted in each zone. However, uh, some type of fire is permitted in all the zones uh, regard, uh, in which the permit falls. So every municipality reviewed does not have such uh, restrictions, uh, meaning permits are available to have a backyard recreational fire as long as all requirements of the bylaw are satisfied. Uh, number three, all bylaws uh, have setback requirements. Uh, so the setback requirements in the City of Pembroke's bylaw is currently four meters or 13 feet. Uh, others uh, base their setback requirements on the type of appliance uh, being used. Uh, so for example, uh, a chiminea, which is a fully enclosed um, um, chiminea. <laughs> uh, it, it requires uh, three meters, uh, whereas a, a fire bowl uh, with a spark arrestor or an open pit may require five meters. So uh, these distances are from areas uh, basically defined, the, def the definition of the areas are buildings, structure, hedge, fence, overhead wiring, trees, or other combustible materials, or the lot line. So basically the setback requirements are from everything. Uh, Aurelia's setback requirements are five meters, period. Uh, most bylaws speak to size requirements for uh, the fire containers. Uh, so I feel that the, uh, size, uh, the size defined in the current city of Pembroke bylaw is, uh, is adequate. Uh, most municipalities employ a permit system, which is core, of course is a formal approval of, for recreational burning. Uh, Aurelia does not have a permit system. Uh, in Aurelia's case, as long as the fire meets the setback re restrictions, the size allotment and the wind conditions requirement, it is deemed approved. Uh, in all other ones, permits are uh, subject to site approval inspections. Uh, all of the local communities, meaning the ones within Renfrew County, have cost recovery, uh, um, a means of cost recovery for these inspections and the permit approval. Uh, Kingston does not have uh, anything like that, so their inspections and permits are provided free. Uh, and uh, of course, Aurelia has no permit process, so there's no uh, associated costs there. Uh, the City of Pembroke uh, updated its permit fees and recreational, uh, for recreational burning in 2021. Uh, this was to bring it in line with, uh, with what we've seen in our neighboring municipalities in Renfrew County. So the, uh, currently the initial uh, permit inspection is uh, $100, 
while uh, um, renewals are $50. Um, staff still feels that this is, these are appropriate numbers. Uh, further, co further to costing, uh, it's strong, strongly recommended uh, that some type of cost recovery be incorporated into any new, uh, any new bylaw. Uh, this particular section would hold owners of properties responsible for any and all extraordinary costs and expenses incurred by the fire department uh, with respect to responding to controlling, extinguishing fires uh, caused by or resulting in the failure to comply with the bylaw or contravening the bylaw. Uh, exemptions uh, are addressed in, in, in all the bylaws. Uh, exemptions are granted for appliances uh, with mechanical means of shutoff. Uh, City of Pembroke currently has those exemptions. Uh, examples of being propane and natural gas appliances or grilling or cooking fires. Uh, examping, examples of cooking fires that are prevalent in other bylaws uh, are uh, smokers, barbecues, uh, masonry barbecues, charcoal appliances, hibachis, and contained wood-fired pizza ovens. Uh, special events are also addressed in the exemption section. Uh, all bylaws address uh, fire bans, uh, permit, withdrawals, permit withdrawals where applicable, and the extinguishment of the fire upon orders from the chief fire official. Uh, some also address wind speed, uh, with no fires permitted when winds reach speeds of 25 kilometers an hour. So there's a multitude of options for council to consider. Uh, some of the options, and these were just uh, uh, options that I came up with just to, to, to maybe start the ball rolling as far as discussion goes. Uh, but number one, uh, continue using the existing bylaw. Uh, although, uh, I'm strongly recommending that we amend the current bylaw to incorporate wording covering ceremonial and sacred fires. Uh, um, staff also recommends exemptions uh, to the current bylaw should also be amended to reflect an updated list of cooking mediums. Uh, and also wind speed should be specified under the dangerous conditions definition. So option two, uh, move forward with option one and include provisions for cost recovery uh, due to, out, uh, as uh, outlined uh, be, uh, before. So currently, the current City of Pembroke uh, bylaw, uh, the permit holder is liable uh, for all damage caused as a result of the fire. So that's just the damage caused by the fire. Um, the City has no means of cost recovery if, if um, you know, we call in, we bring in a lot of resources. Uh, option number three, uh, remove the geographical barriers and make recreational burning available to all properties that meet the current setback requirements. Uh, option number four, uh, set up zones in which specific types of fires would be permitted. Uh, for example, uh, similar to Kingston, we could look at uh, one zone perhaps incorporating all the areas that are currently approved for fires uh, while looking at uh, possible use of, uh, of specific appliances in other areas such as the chimeneas or uh, smokeless fire appliances. So uh, like I said, there's a number of options for council to consider. Uh, financial implications, uh, staff feel the current fee structure of the permit system is up to date and in line with neighboring municipalities. Uh, also the penalties laid out in Schedule A are also up to date. Uh, with potential for purchasing permits possibly increased with any changes to the bylaw, uh, revenues generated in the first year would be substantially higher as it would be uh, the full fee would be applied. Uh, and then subsequent uh, renewals afterwards would only be half the cost. So currently we average 25 permits a year at, uh, at, at the uh, renewal fee of $50, generating between uh, $1,250 to $1,500 annually. Uh, there is uh, potential for increased costs uh, to the city due to responses caused by nuisance calls and complaints. Although uh, most neighboring municipalities, meaning uh, Renfrew, Armprior, Petawawa, and Deep River, uh, they have not experienced a significant uh, increase in uh, complaint calls. Uh, Renfrew averages three responses a year under a non-restrictive, meaning a no geograph geographical boundary system due to complaints. Uh, currently, the Pembroke Fire Department responds to an average of 15 calls uh, for unapproved and unpermitted fires a year. Thank you. So, 
we have Councillor Keel and Mayor Gerbe and then Councillor Plummer. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, very good report, uh, Chief Sell. Uh, very happy to receive it. Uh, my position is going to be that we proceed with, uh, with number three, uh, that we take off the uh, geographical restrictions. Um, I'm certainly going to proceed uh, with a permit uh, with cost. Um, I understand some of the other municipalities uh, might not be keen on that one, but uh, I think having some cost recovery uh, um, uh, just for the, the initial uh, approval and processing and whatnot makes sense. Um, the cost, uh, the actual cost recovery, I think the one thing that, uh, that is great about having the permit system is having a permit is like having a license, which is an agreement with the municipality. And so certainly requiring them to cover any costs. And I know when you and, when you and I spoke, um, you know, even if they have to take certain equipment off the truck, that means that truck's not av available to immediately respond. Um, so I would be looking, I mean, if we're going to, and I, I hope council will, if we're going to take the step of opening this up a bit more for our residents, I think they need to understand that it's going to come with regulations and it's going to come with, uh, with costs if they're not doing their due diligence. And I'm okay with that. Um, sometimes when, uh, you know, when you allow a bit more freedom, there's also a bit more oversight and, uh, and, and I'm perfectly okay with, with that. Um, when it comes to, uh, and I'm gonna leave this one entirely to you because I don't feel myself an expert in this. Um, in terms of, I, I don't know that I like the idea of different zones and whatnot, um, but if there was a property that was maybe a little bit smaller, um, that maybe they could meet the three meter um, requirement that they have for the chimneys, uh, the chimneas, or, or um, I guess Kingston also shows a picture of a, basically building a fireplace in your backyard. Um, if that was open for a three meter permit, um, whereas the open permit would still require the five. Um, so obviously if you have a nearly fully enclosed fire system, I, I suspect that that's safer than other open burning types, but I'm gonna leave that in, entirely in your hands because uh, I think that's a fire safety thing. Um, but if that was something that was, that was possible, that then might give some property owner maybe not the open fire that they want, um, but a system where they could have a largely enclosed fire. But I'll, le I'll leave that one uh, uh, to you. Um, but other than that, I think uh, I, I heard a lot about fires on the campaign trail, but I also campaigned on it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what other, what other councillors have to say, because I don't, uh, I think when you campaign on something, of course all the supporters come out and greet you. So. I don't think I'm a good, uh, I, I think I'd be a bit of a, a biased poll um, in terms of this, but uh, number three, well-regulated is the direction I would like to go. Jervais. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief, for your uh, thorough research. Obviously, you've spent an awful lot of time researching it and preparing a, a thorough report. Um, I would like to think that we would all agree that safety is paramount, so it's nice to, to have recreational fires, and certainly I'm in support of, of uh, amending uh, and looking at this differently. Uh, having said that, we need only look around and see all the different fires and see the haze in the sky tonight. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, I believe it was the mayor of uh, Halifax uh, today on CBC was uh, commenting about a resident who had a propane torch and he was uh, burning leaves knowing that it was extremely dry and then causes uh, issues or at least the potential for issues. So I think we have to keep that in mind and I think we also need to keep in mind that uh, we are an urban municipality and that uh, um, sometimes there's issues with... Uh, um, trying to keep compatible situations in, in terms of uh, neighborhoods. And so I'll touch on that one in a second. But certainly I, I have no issue in terms of having a different recreational bylaw with being highly regulated so as to ensure that uh, that we don't run afoul or we don't run into issues uh, with some sort of full cost recovery because I, I anticipate that we will have uh, enforcement that will need to be happening and certainly as a taxpayer I wouldn't necessarily want to be having to pay for enforcement of our fire department uh, if I'm not the one that's that's causing uh, the issue um, 
one item that I found interesting in your report, and if we are serious about 6C when we get to EDI, uh, is this idea of ceremonial and sacred fires. And certainly I'm, I'm curious about council members, about uh, their thoughts about dedicating a particular location, whether it be Coronation Park or some location where there's a permanent uh, location that uh, uh, folks like Algonquins of Greater Golden Lake are consulted as to uh, what is uh, appropriate, what are they looking for, uh, so we can try and, and, and uh, incorporate or include uh, that segment of, of our uh, community uh, into wh what it is that we do. Um, the last piece that I guess that I, I was looking at is so that if, if uh, this council, this committee, uh, uh, approved having some sort of bylaw coming forward, I would be uh, interested in some sort of public consultation uh, just so as to uh, engage the public. But the last piece, and I said I would touch on it, uh, is that I'm curious about, uh, about um, neighbors and so forth and whether or not there's going to be a requirement to uh, tell the fire department, yes, I've consulted with my neighbors, uh, because I, I do recall back to 2020, as I understand it, the, the current bylaw, and that was some of the discussion was that some neighbors didn't want smoke coming in their uh, in their windows, didn't want to, had asthma issues or, or what have you. And so you're trying to, it's, it's not that we're a rural setting where, you know, you have a two acre lot, in which case if you have a fire, maybe it doesn't impact the neighbors. So I'm, I'm curious about that particular item, but I, I am agreeable to a highly regulated uh, system to ensure the safety of, of the residents uh, that has some sort of you know full cost recovery concept so that others aren't paying for what's going on. But that, that particular part I'm still having some challenges with, but perhaps if there's public consultation that will work its way out. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I am definitely uh, in favor of this as I've, uh, brought this up on a previous term trying to open it up and seemed it didn't seem logical how a backyard on uh, that say backed onto water technically but there was a steep ravine between yourself and the water they were allowed that property was allowed to have a fire and yet you could have open a large backyard in some other location in Pembroke that didn't necessarily back on the water wasn't allowed so I think it's uh, prudent that we look at uh, case by case and uh, through a permit process you can determine the chief can determine or his staff can determine that yes this is appropriate setbacks to have a fire i think uh, i am in full support of opening bylaw i'm also um, well aware there are properties that will not meet the meet the standard and people are going to be mad they say well my neighbor can have a backyard fire why can't i i'm sorry you have overhead hanging trees you're too close to other buildings to, to that close to setbacks, so we're going to get we're going to get flack, no matter what. If we change the bylaw now, there are going to be ratepayers that are going to come in and say, "Hey, it's not fair. I want to have a backyard fire, and why can't I?" Well, that's why we have a, a, a chief uh, fire chief and his capable staff to go and determine that said, "Yes, you can have one. Unfortunately, your neighbor cannot." So that's just the nature of the game. And there's going to be, uh, we do have realized opening a bylaw up, opening up more opportunity to have fires it lists more opportunity to have a mistake and have something actually light on fire. So we have to be conscious of that. But again, we, we have to rely on the permit process saying that, you know, people have to do their due diligence and be respectful. Fire is a, as we see around us, is a, a, a live thing. It can, you know, spread quickly. Uh, we have to be conscious of everything we're doing and be, have uh, proper safety equipment and hoses and everything else around it and not lean, uh, uh, combustible material close to the fire. So saying that, I uh, trust the, uh, you know, people that are going to have a fire to, to use their good judgment and get a permit. And I kick it back to the chief saying, please uh, come back with a proper designed uh, bylaw that sets up a, a, a clear understanding of what's expected, but also not restricting, saying it's open to all, zo all areas of Pembroke, but they must meet the certain standard. Thank you. Councillor Lafreniere. Um, I have a couple of questions um, in your report. Um, item uh, sorry, three. It mentions the fact that we have already in Pembroke a four meter, so a 13 foot distance setback requirement. I, I don't think 13 feet is enough, so I read on further and it says that um, for an, a fire pit, it's 16 feet. 
Can you just clarify all those numbers? I yeah. apologize if I missed that one. Uh, so. And I'll just state what my concern is before you uh, cor uh, just clarify that. I would like to see a size uh, a lot allotment for a property that can have a fire. Because when I look at these numbers, even if it's 16 feet from a structure, and it's 16 feet this way, that's only 32 feet. That's a pretty small yard. So I'm just thinking, you know, I know my property's 66 wide, and I would probably, it would suit my yard. But I'm thinking if my yard was half that size, I don't know, and it wasn't very deep, I don't know but if you I would. also have a tree as Exactly. Well, so, so I'm thinking, yeah, so size allotment I think oh. is important. Um, so I, I don't know, it's not really in here. It talks about it. It says that Aurelia does have a size allotment. So I would like to see that as well. Yeah. So if you could, yeah. I, that, that would certainly be addressed. What was it you were going to clarify then about the 13 feet, 16 feet? Us. So in our current bylaw, but the four meters that if, if, uh, if council wishes, that's what would remain, or we could look at, uh, or we could look at five meters. That, that will be uh, council's deci decision. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, I would like to see the five meters to begin. I mean, like, because I don't want people cramming a fire in, especially since we're just starting this. So thank you. Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm just trying to refresh myself as why we kiboshed it in the first place. And secondly, with Bill 23 coming forward and more properties being built on existing lots, is that going to affect how this works as well? I mean, obviously, you have to be so many feet away, but will three individual houses or subcomponents on one property be allowed to have a fire pit? So if you had 30 of those in a row, times three is 90 fire pits, are you gonna get what we're seeing out here today? How, how would you address that? Is it all spe specifically to distance, right? From A to B? Got through you, Chair. Uh, yes, it would, be, uh, it would be distance. And you recall why, why we kiboshed this in the first place? People had fires previously you don't remember, uh, I can't uh, remember. Unfortunately, I, uh, I can Prior to remember. your time, okay, not your fault. Very good, thank you. Councillor Plummer, then Councillor Frenier. Through the Chair, um, to the Chief, how many current, you, I believe back in the, the quote is 24 permits are currently pulled? Do you have a number? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, we average uh, 25 uh, permits a year. Okay, so follow up, then how many calls do you get to those 25 is there for a uh, runaway fire we'll call it uh, we've not had one okay and further that the current bylaw states that it's a four meter setback is that correct i believe so yes okay so then then final comment then would be i would keep the current bylaw as it's four meters uh respecting counselor uh, Lafreniers understand that maybe we want to increase it, but would doing so would not eliminate those current holders of permits. Maybe they can't meet meet the five meters, and they've hadn't had an issue with the uh, four meters for X amount of time, and we haven't had those calls. So, I would certainly like to see the bylaw come forward using the current bylaw as it's, as an outline, and then moving forward. Uh, to redo the open up to all areas of the city. Thank you. Friend, you. So I'm going to answer uh, through the chair. Um, the reason we it was defeated the last time it was at council was health concerns. Uh, I, I would imagine that that was the main reason, if I recall from the conversation, because I was around the table. Um, that's why I'm also looking at the five meter increase. And in regards to Councillor Plummer's concern about those who already have the four meter, we could grandfather those in. And we could say that those are grandfathered. But at, at least by increasing it, that extra meter, 
it may help to reduce any kind of smoke that may trickle because that's going to give you a meter on each side of the fire which gives you two more meters to play with so I mean I would support grandfathering the four meters for anyone who has it existing but going in with the five meter restriction just so that the fire is a little further away from everybody keeping everybody happy Councillor uh, Keel, then Purcell, and then uh, I'll speak after that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, in terms of, uh, uh, I think it was going back to some of the mayor's comments. Um, I mean, some of the some of the examples that we looked at. Um, I mean, certainly Kingston. I know it has its more rural part on uh, north of the 401, but it's about as urban as it can get, and. Uh, Certainly no one, I haven't seen anything online about people getting smoked out of Kingston. Um, I know there's, I know there's, there's obviously some people that, that are looking forward to this, but I mean, I would be shocked if all of a sudden, um, you know, by the end of the summer, there's a thousand extra permits. I don't, uh, you know, I don't think that many people are, are looking for fires or whatnot. Um, in terms of the distance, and, and I know I spoke with the chief, um, and I think the, the number of recreational backyard fires that has caused structural damage or whatnot, um, I thought you had said was, was very low to almost non-existent. Um. Uh, through you, Chair, um, the, the neighboring municipalities uh, being um, um, the ones in Renfrew County, I did ask them if they had ever responded because they all have... Uh, they all have similar bylaws to what uh, you know, Councillor Plummer is is uh, moving towards already. Uh, whereas anybody can purchase a, a permit, and they have never ever once uh, said that they've had a fire get out of hand. So, so I think that's that's important to recognize when when we're looking at things, and and we've never had one with our with our four meters. Um, in terms of smoke, I I would I would like to think that all of us have sat around a campfire. And we certainly don't sit five meters away from it. For the most part, unless it's a windy day, the, the smoke is going fairly straight up. Um, I feel fairly confident saying that as, as someone that's, that's camped and, and spent some time around fires. Um, and I think if, if the smoke is blowing into the neighbor's yard and it visibly is blowing into the neighbor's yard, that's probably suggesting that we're violating the, wind, the that moment's wind uh, wind facility but uh, but again I think there are some some regulations I, I like the mayor's idea of, of some public consultation I know there had been concerns I think during the last when I watched the video from the last one I think someone around the table even mentioned like laundry and whatnot and I said to the chief when I met with him look if, if between May and the end of September we say no burning during the day I got to be honest with you I don't know that many people that sit around a campfire on a July afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon, I don't know that we would be bothering them if we, you know, if we had some of those restrictions. But that could come out in a public consultation um, process. So I'm certainly, I'm certainly in favor of, of opening things up. But I also want us, uh, and not just on this matter, but generally speaking, when we're talking about regulating things, um, are we regulating it for the sake of regulation, or are we regulating it because there's a known specific element that uh, that raises concern um, but uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to Councillor Lafreniere's uh, five meter um, I just uh, my position is is that I would leave that to the chief uh, um, in terms of what he ex uh, believes is safe because I think that ultimately is is the most important part um, and then in terms of uh, obviously there's uh, the fine aspect we haven't really talked about that um, but I got to tell you, I, I have no problem if th our fine during a burn ban is one of the highest fines that we could level. Um, that is a very serious, um, a very serious matter. I would have that person's uh, um, permit pulled faster than they could put the fire out. Um, so those are some some things to look at as well. And I know you and I looked at the fine structure, but uh, I think there I think there was a line item. Uh, burning during a fire ban and if we wanted to jack that up to the highest fine allowed I mean I would if that did nothing other than set a send a point to the people Thank you uh, Councillor Purcell Thank you chair <clears throat> 
Um, just a few comments. I think we need to promote the recreational fire pits at Riverside Park for those individuals that don't meet those uh, minimum distance requirements so that those are available and they can actually book those um, um, those um, fire, fire uh, um, uh, places. Um, I think we need to ensure that we're, we talk about fuel. Um, we always have people that decide that they're going to burn their this week's garbage uh, or um, pressure treated wood, um, you know, other types of um, things. So it needs to be, um, you know, it needs to be firewood that's, that's, that's put into that, uh, into that receptacle. Um, I do hear concerns in regards to um, health concerns uh, from some residents um, as well. Um, and I'm not sure, but I'm sure, you know, not so much that there was a response, but um, I'm sure that there was probably increased noise complaints as a result of the implementation of the fireplaces. So that's just one thing that we need to look at as well. So maybe you could just kind of look back at those municipalities and say, hey, um, you know, was there an increase in terms of your noise complaints after hours? Because, I mean, you know, people typically are use uh, recreation fires as a place to socialize and uh, socializing becomes a little bit louder um, in the midnight hours and it could be disturbing to some of our residents. So um, I think that's the other thing. And there's also devices out there such as smokeless fire rings. Um, and I know they work. Um, I've known a bunch of individuals that actually have them and, and burning the right fuel in it, smoke is not an issue. So maybe it's just another type of device that maybe we just got to say, hey, this is what we can utilize in terms of um, this type of, of, of setup so that way it minimizes uh, disruption of smoke to the neighbors. So uh, just a couple opportunities to, to look at that and I can provide you some additional information on the, uh, the fireless uh, or the smokeless uh, fire rings. Thank you. So if I can speak from the chair, uh, last term, uh, Councillor Lafreni and I had a motion on the floor for a pilot project based upon the Aurelia five meter setback and it didn't get approved. So I'll, I support uh, the outdoor fires, you know, being regulated. Five meter distance, uh, proper uh, base, uh, safety regulations, uh, wind speed 25 kilometers an hour, public consultation, as was mentioned before. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd support it if we did it as a pilot project also. I think that's important. We did a pilot project approval for the ATVs on the going down Townland Road and that. And I think it gives you an, a method to t tell the residents we're trying this. If it goes well, we'll continue. We're going to look at all, work out all the kinks. Um, five meters won't please everyone, but I think it's better to be safe. Uh, and as Councillor Purcell said, the hours of operation also. Uh, I got feedback from residents on this and most of them favor it. There was concerns about smoke and, and that. Um, so those are my uh, basic uh, echoing what others have said, but I, I support the, uh, I don't know Chief what your comment is on the pilot project, but that's, that's what I, I support the five meters in the pilot and everything else people said. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, one more uh, comment before I go. I just wanted to remind everybody that there is a current uh, burning bylaw or ban on, yeah. so all permits in the City of Pembroke are suspended at this time. Thank you. So you have enough feedback, Chief, or Councillor Purcell? Is that posted on our City of Pembroke website in terms of, you know, the wheel, the, you know, high hazard time, do you know fires? Uh, through you, Chair. I have been in discussion uh, and I believe it is posted on the website. Uh, we've also uh, shared it several times on our uh, social media platforms as well as the City's social media platforms. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 6C, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Update. CEO, Mr. Unrah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so first I wanted to state that the City of Pembroke, um, among many other municipalities, organizations, and society in general, are on a journey of education and awareness in regards to uh, this subject matter. Uh, individuals, municipalities, organizations are all on different spots along the journey. 
Uh, so I just wanted to kind of lead off with saying that I, I think that we need to exercise patience as we go through this journey for each and every one of us, each organization. Um, so in regards to the report, um, so I, I thought I'd start with, you know, the actual uh, definition in regards to uh, 2S LGBTQIA+. Uh, um, and, uh, and just the statement that it is an important uh, part of the city of Pembroke and was identified as a, a fundamental truth in the strategy uh, consultation that we just completed in February uh, that involved uh, staff members, council, and uh, also uh, different um, sectors within the, the community. So it was a, a fundamental truth within, the, within that uh, uh, discussion. Um, I've listed out uh, in the report uh, several of the activities that have been completed to date. I won't uh, go through the complete list, but I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, so in um, October of uh, 2023, actually, it's, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, so the, that was incorrect. It should have been October 2022. Uh, we worked with a consultant to develop a proposed diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, and the presentation was in October. Um, we developed sections in the City of Pembroke website. So if anyone is interested, I, I, I would say take a look at that website. It's, it's quite, uh, quite good in regards to uh, providing information um, and um, um, not only for residents, but uh, newcomers uh, to our area. Um, we acknowledge and celebrate a diverse set of uh, cultural ho holidays through the city's online uh, platform. Uh, we've conducted surveys and round tables uh, to allow vi various groups um, provide input. Uh, we support community events and stakeholders uh, leading in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, a couple of examples are the Multicultural Festival, uh, Pembroke Pride. Um, their main events were uh, this weekend, but uh, all of June is uh, Pride Month. Um, cultural fests, um, and then also even supporting uh, the Algonquin College Medicine Wheel Garden dedication that was uh, happened on June 2nd um, at the college. We've also had uh, staff training, um, and so that was uh, conducted in February 2021, um, and that was with an external consultant, and that, that was all of staff that participated in that. And we've met with uh, Algonquins of Penwoktagon, uh, First Nations, and the Algonquins of Greater Golden Lake, First Nations. So that's just a, a small list of, of some of the, uh, the accomplishments to date. Um, the vision that I've put forward here is, is up for discussion, um, but I, I'd like to see that City of Pembroke uh, be an employer of choice for Renfrew County, where any employee feels a sense of belonging safe to work and to bring forward issues and complaints. Residents and visitors can enter any facility and receive services in manners that meet their needs and they feel included and welcome. We work together with other major employers in the region and other municipalities to strengthen our culture, i.e. the Pembroke Regional Hospital and Algonquin College. International students at Algonquin College enter the area to study and fall in love with the region and stay after graduation because they feel welcomed. Vulnerable population is heard in municipal politics and in elections. The City of Pembroke commits to work actively to challenge and respond to bias, harassment and discrimination. Uh, moving forward, uh, equity, diversion and inclusion will be an underlying priority for this city and the following actions will aid in, in that regards. So again, I'm not gonna go through the complete list, but I'll just highlight a couple items that are on here. So in regards to uh, council and staff, um, there were three modules that were identified in our HR download software um, and uh, circulated to staff and council to take. 
Um, there was uh, evolving the workplace cultural for equity, diversion, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and that took place on April 5th and 6th of this year. And we had over 100 participants, uh, which included council and staff members. Um, as I mentioned before, but just to reinforce, EDI and climate change are fundamental truths within the city of Pembroke's strategic plan and under all decision making. Uh, EDI is a standing agenda item at our monthly management meetings. So at every monthly meeting that we have with management, we talk about uh, equity, diversion, and inclusion and what it means, um, if there's anything that uh, has happened in the past month. Uh, so that is a monthly thing that we do. Uh, CEO has attended the EDI committee meetings at PRH and at Gonkle College. So I think it's very important to see what other organizations within the area are doing and, um, you know, because we, we form the, the larger community and that we have a common um, messaging and uh, partnership. And I'll explain that actually just the next bullet. Uh, so collaborate with uh, Pembroke Regional Hospital, Algonquin College, local immigration partners, or LIP, and with other key Pembroke stakeholders organizations on EDI initiatives, uh, such as um, possibly a creation of a community of practice. Uh, did something similar to that with Renfrew County in regards to asset management and, and just bringing up the knowledge and, and education. Um, or initiative to support college students while they stay in our community. Um, I think in January we had over 100 international students and, uh, you know, see, you know, what they need and, and what they're looking for. Uh, under social media, we're going to uh, look at modernize the revised social media policy and then at the education portion of that. Uh, under harm and whistleblowing, so ensure a clear and accessible and confidential pathway to reporting. Um, ensure that the messaging pathway created is not a crisis response. I think I want to really emphasize that. Um, you know, if it is a crisis, uh, there are other avenues uh, to be taken, but this will be something that we'll be reviewing on a regular basis and possibly talk at our monthly uh, manager's meetings. Um, on uh, outcomes and that. Um, under reconciliation, um, seek to understand and, and continue the discussions with uh, First Nation communities. Um, I think Mayor Ger Gervais was getting tired of uh, the little roadshow that we we're doing in regards to all the different municipalities that we're visiting, but one of the things that we also did was uh, we had meetings with the Algonquins of Pequoknagon First Nations and the Algonquins of Greater Golden Lake First Nations. Um, and those conversations have continued on several times, and uh, we've certainly also engaged them in, in certain discussions. Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to do is uh, update the diversity, equity, inclusion page on the city of Pembroke. As I said, like it is a great page right now, but it doesn't include some of the, the recent things, like the uh, installation that we have at the um, East End Mall, uh, the Turtle, Turtle Lodge, I believe. Um, it doesn't have the, um, the medicine wheel that we have at the Gonkong College. You know, great resources within the, uh, the city of Pembroke. Um, I think there's a, a partnership with the Robbie Dean Center in regards to uh, counseling. Um, so, you know, those are things that we should be highlighted on the website. Um, another initiative is the uh, Create a Safe Space, so a sticker campaign for downtown businesses. Um, you know, so to say that, you know, any individual coming into our place of business it's a safe space for everyone involved. So that's a sticker campaign that we would like to do this year. Um, that's all I wanted to highlight and just open up to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Unrod. Uh, first, we have Councillor Purcell. Thanks, Dave, for your report. I appreciate that. Um, I think seeing, um, you know, in terms of what's transpired um, in terms of action, um, I'm very pleased to see the direction that we are going. Um, I know this is a journey, and um, I know it's difficult, 
um, in terms of changing behaviors, um, changing the way that we think, um, especially about you know people that um, may not be the same as us. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for us to continue down that journey, look at incorporating the community safety plan, um, looking at you know opportunities to identify you know our most vulnerable society and ensuring that they're safe um, and that they have a safe um, you know community to live in. Um, I'm very pleased in terms of uh, Mayor Gervais um, promised uh, back when we actually um, dissolved the um, diversity and equity um, uh, committee. Um, I'm very pleased to, to see the progress that you've made and, and you've lived up to your promise in terms of your commitment uh, to ensure um, that Pembroke will continue um, with this diversity and inclusion um, initiative. So, so thank you, Mayor Gervais, for that. Um, and thank you, Dave, for um, you know, all the work that you've done in terms of staff training on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I know that you've um, been um, acquainting yourself with um, you know, First Nations. Uh, um, you've been acquainting yourself with various different traditional ceremonies. Uh, and as a member of the Huron-Wendat, um, I am just thankful um, that we have um, a council um, and the employees of the City of Pembroke that truly do care about one another and care about uh, the success of the most vulnerable populations in our, in our society. So, so thank you and um, keep up the great work. I think we're on the right track. Um, are we there yet? No. Uh, do we need to continue doing what we're doing? I think we're doing the right things. And if we continue down this journey, uh, Pembroke will be uh, one of the best communities um, for individuals to come and feel supported um, and um, you know, to be successful in terms of whatever they choose to do. So thank you very much. Do we have any other comments or questions for the CEO? Councillor Frenier. I just want to say um, I was in Niagara Falls last week. Uh, Police Services Board had a conference, and we had a speaker that was dynamic. And he spoke about diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility. And he really made you think in a very different way. Um, as a gay man and an activist, um, very well educated, he was hilarious. He could talk to you in a way that you understood, and he made you feel like you weren't really that bad. Maybe you weren't aware, and you maybe d weren't educated, you know, about how to address issues of today. But he really made me look at it a different way. So, diversity is a fact. Now, diversity is not something you create. This council is even diverse. And he, he said it in a really unusual way because he said you can't create diversity. Any group of people are diverse because they all grew up in a different home. They all could have different educational backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different opinions. So he said the color of your skin or your sexuality doesn't make you diverse. It's a group of people that are very different, but the more types of groups of people you engage increases your diversity. So, you know, I look around this table tonight and I say, yeah, we are diverse, but can we do better? Perhaps. We can be more open. And that's where inclusion, equity, and accessibility come in because that is a choice. And that is what he told us that day. That, and it kind of opened my mind a bit to think, okay, yeah, diversity, we can only control that a little. We have to also incorporate inclusion, equity, and accessibility into our hiring practices. Um, and you talked about bias and unconscious bias and how we are raised in environments where maybe we had an older person who was very influential in our life that talked a certain way. And you know, that stays in your brain. And that's exactly, Councillor Purcell mentioned the brain. A lot of what we do or say or opinions we formed they're automatic because we've thought them for so long or we've spoke those words for so long, they're just a natural impulse. So anyway, if staff w was ever interested in hiring him to speak to us, he is amazing. Michael Bach is his name. He's, he's a successful um, professor, 
author. Um, I invite you to look him up. He's very entertaining too. And he would probably crit critique the decor in this room quite well. <laughs> anyway, he's, he's great. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Dave, also for uh, doing the research. <clears throat> I just recently finished reading a book by, uh, uh, well, it was a biography about uh, Colin Powell, who was the uh, first black uh, defense head in the United States. <clears throat> if I can say black, he was actually, <clears throat> he was a Jamaican. But in his book, he spoke about the prejudice and the lack of diversity that occurred where he was living amongst the black populace in New York. And he said where he was prejudiced against because he was a Jamaican. Yet, you know, he didn't, he didn't consider himself uh, colored or black or uh, native uh, African American, but he, he said that prejudice exists everywhere, even within the cultures that, that say, you know, look at me, you, you should have more empathy for me. Uh, but it was rather interesting, uh, but he was introduced as the first black chief of defense staff when the introduction should have been the first Jamaican chief of staff. So anyway, diversity grows with all of us. Thank you, Councillor Jagano. If I could speak from the chair, uh, Mr. Unrod, you have here uh, worked together with major employers in the region, and I know uh, they're not listed. But I know you. I know that they're a partner with the city, and you've you've contacted them. Is the uh, Renfrew County District School Board, uh, who I teach for, and uh, at the school I'm at, there's a general the gender neutral washroom. There's uh, banners in every room outside that says this is a safe place. Uh, they they uh, fly the pride flag every June. Very proactive in accepting people of different uh, diverse background. And uh, it's important that we work with uh, partners in the community to further that in our, uh, in our city of Pembroke. Thank you. Uh, adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Jackano. Seconded. Councillor Plummer. We are adjourned.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this council meeting to order for June 6. I'd ask that everyone please stand for an opening prayer and reflection. Before opening this meeting of council, I would ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest this evening? Seeing none, uh, we have a number of different minutes to work our way through. The first is the approval of the regular meetings of council minutes for May 16th, 2023. I'd entertain a motion for their approval. Deputy Mayor, second by Councillor Plummer. Those in favor? That's carried. Moving on to committees, we have first up Planning and Development Committee, May 2nd, 2023. Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Purcell, seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. Those in favor? That's carried. We have Finance and Administration Committee being the second uh, committee this evening, May 2nd, 2023. Councillor Lafreniere, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? That is carried. Last, we have receiving minutes from local boards. We have the Ottawa Valley Waste Recovery Center, March 30th, 2023. I move by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Lafreniere. Those in favour? And that is carried. There are two proclamations this evening. Uh, the first is regarding Seniors Month. I do hereby declare the month of June 2023 as Seniors Month in the City of Pembroke. Whereas June is recognized as Seniors Month in Ontario and is an annual nationwide celebration. Whereas this year's theme is working for seniors. And whereas seniors have contributed and continue to contribute immensely to the life and vibrancy of this community. And whereas seniors continue to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers and important and active members of our community. And whereas their contributions past and present warrant appreciation and recognition and their stories deserve to be told. And whereas the health and well-being of seniors in, uh, is in the interest of all and further adds to the health and well-being of our community. And whereas the knowledge and experience seniors pass on us continues to benefit all of us. Therefore, I, Ron Gerva, Mayor of the City of Pembroke, to hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as Seniors Month and encourage all citizens to recognize and celebrate the accomplishments of our seniors. As noted, June is Seniors Month in Ontario. It's an opportunity to acknowledge and recognize the amazing seniors across this province and the positive impact that they have on our lives. The theme for Seniors Month this year, working for seniors, recognizes the importance of seniors keeping active, well, and safe in our communities. We all have seniors in our lives, whether they be friends, families, and colleagues. Please join me in recognizing June as Seniors Month by recognizing the seniors in our lives. The next proclamation we have this evening is Stroke Awareness Month, June 2023 being declared as Stroke Awareness Month in the City of Pembroke, whereas June is Stroke Awareness Month in Canada, a time to raise awareness of the signs and symptoms of stroke and how to act fast in this medical emergency. And whereas the Champlain Regional Stroke Network, based at the Ottawa Hospital Regional Stroke Centre, is accountable for the leadership, development, implementation, and coordination of stroke care within the, the Champlain region. And whereas we are raising awareness and advocating for stroke care through a social media campaign at the Regional Stroke Centre Civic Campus of the Ottawa Hospital and in collaboration with the Champlain District Stroke Centres in Pembroke and Cornwall, and whereas we will increase awareness about the signs and symptoms of stroke, particularly in the areas of women's health and mental health. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Ron Gerva, Mayor of the City of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim this month of June as Stroke Awareness Month in the City of Pembroke. A stroke uh, is a life-changing event physically and emotionally. Every stroke is unique, and so is the recovery of the individual. A stroke occurs when blood stops flowing to any part of the brain damaging brain cells. After the onset of acute stroke, approximately 2 million brain cells die every minute. It's a medical emergency and requires care right away. The effects of stroke depend upon the part of the brain that has been damaged and the amount of damage that has been done. 
There has been advancements uh, with diagnosing and treating stroke patients to improve outcomes, including survival and quality of life. However, more than 400,000 Canadians are living with long-term disability from the effects of a stroke. Education and knowledge are powerful tools that can significantly improve our ability to protect ourselves and our loved ones regarding the risk of stroke. Next, we have bylaws. I have Council, or sorry, Deputy Mayor Abdallah, 2023-44. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ed Jackano, the bylaw 2023-44, a bylaw to establish fees and charges on persons per payment of municipal services, activities, and use of municipal property for the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Mr. Anra, moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Jack, and our bylaw 2023-44, bylaw to establish fees and charges on persons for payment of municipal service, activities and use of municipal property for the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Deputy Mayor, did you wish to speak to it? Yes. Uh, please be advised that the new fees and charges by bylaw 2023-34 must be repealed to remove the building permit and administrative fees and plumbing application fees from the bylaw. These fees and charges are presently addressed under the city's building bylaw 2018-01 as per the Building Code Act and are subject to annual increases to the consumer price index as published annually by Stats Canada. Therefore, the new fees and charges bylaw 2023-34 will be replaced by bylaw 2023-44, this new bylaw will remove the building and plumbing fees from Schedule B as they are already addressed under bylaw 2018-01. Thank you. Uh, call the question, those in favor? And that is carried, thank you. <coughs> the next is motions, resolution 2023-11, Councillor Jackno. Thank you, Your Worship. Members of the Council, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Plummer, be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from Michael Conroy at 259 Pembroke Street East under the Community Improvement Plan. The applicant must comply with grant guidelines of the Facade Improvement Grant and will have 18 months to complete all work and submit receipts in order to receive the grant. The grant total awarded to this applicant is $5,000 and awaiting your signature, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Anra. Moved by Councillor Jack and a second by Councillor Plummer, be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application for Michael Conroy at 259 Pembroke Street East under the Community Improvement Plan. The applicant complying with grant guidelines of facade improvement grant and will have 18 months to complete the work and submit receipts to receive the grant. Grant total to this applicant, $5,000. Did you wish to speak to the matter, Councillor Jack? I do, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, the Community Improvement Plan, uh, again, is one of the most uh, valuable initiatives, I think, that the City of Pembroke has brought forward over a number of years. Not only does it supply uh, new business people uh, with some uh, hard-earned cash that they can use in repairing their facades, etc., or putting it towards their buildings, it also provides much-needed jobs in the area to tradesmen such as carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. So it's a good thing. Uh, the money comes back into the community. Thank you. Thank you. Call the question. Those in favor? And that is carried. Uh, Mayor's report. On May 20th, I had the pleasure to attend the opening of the farmer's market for the year together with the deputy mayor. There was a number of vendors there with great items for sale. Uh, we have the pleasure, we had the pleasure to cut a loaf of bread to kick off the season. That's a first for me. Um, I was pleased to attend the farmer's market and I would hope and encourage everyone to attend the farmer's market to support the local economy uh, and get some great items at the same time. On May 24th, I had the pleasure to welcome Governor of Kiwanis, Anthony 
Howley and First Lady Ingrid Howley to the City of Pembroke. And I'm going to say this wrong. I'm going to say Caraco is where they're from, but I know that that's, uh, he made a comment that that's not how you pronounce it, and I can't remember how he pronounced that. But he was here in Pembroke uh, on behalf of uh, the Kiwanis Club of Pembroke. Uh, it was a great pleasure to share a meal with him and catch up with fellow Kiwanians. Uh, the message left from the governor is that our children are important as they are our future, and he was, I was pleased to receive a governor's pin from him. On May 25th, I had the pleasure to attend a grand opening uh, together with the uh, Deputy Mayor of Connected Counseling Services located at the former MyFM building, which is at 84 Isabella Street for those looking to connect to that service. Uh, they are dedicated to providing high quality and inclusive individual trauma relationships, cu uh, couples and sex therapy services to all humans regardless of means. Uh, May 26, Councillor Keel and I were pleased to receive the pride flag from Jamie Hawes and Jill Holroyd and other organizers. Uh, we are proudly flying the flag for the month of June. Uh, Pembroke must continue to strive to be an inclusive community to all residents. We have and will continue to make steps towards that ongoing goal, which as the CAO says is an ongoing uh, journey. May 31st, I was most fortunate to uh, attend Options 2023. It was really nice to attend uh, Options 2023 after the hiatus of a couple of years due to COVID. As a municipality, we employ many skilled trades workers to keep our city operating smoothly. We are aware that there's critical shortages in many sectors of the labor market, including the skilled trades. This is why events like Options is so important and I really thank the entire council for being supportive of this particular initiative uh, by our local college. It gives youth an opportunity to learn more about the wonderful career opportunities that exist in the skilled trades. It was well attended. Uh, we are most fortunate to have this partnership with, uh, for this event with the Algonquin College Waterfront Campus. June 2nd, had the pleasure to attend and say a few words on behalf of City Council at the Pride Walk and festivities, together with the Deputy Mayor and Councillor uh, Councillor Keel. Uh, truly, I believe that Pembroke is becoming a more welcoming and inclusive city. I'm very proud of this. I realize that sometimes there are certain steps backwards and we must just continue to persevere. Uh, June 5th, I welcomed Tonka Arcos and her husband. They're, uh, they're from Chile. Uh, they moved here in August of last year. Uh, she has started a new business called Cake in a Jar. Uh, it's a home-based business and it's very tasty. Um, they, uh, they can be located on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, he is working as a um, chef at Grey Gables. And so I would ask that you please join me in welcoming to, uh, them to our community. I did ask, I was curious as to what uh, took them uh, or caused them to come to Pembroke. Not that I certainly wanted to encourage them, which is why I was asking so we can try and duplicate that. And what I was told is that there was a chef at Grey Gables that reached out to him, which was his student once upon a time in Chile, and said, hey, you should come to Pembroke, Ontario. It's, it's a great place to be. So I was very pleased to hear that as, as, the, um, as the comment as to why they were here. Um, on a much more serious note, however, I want to comment upon about the incident that had transpired on May 22nd. I want to again begin by de uh, expressing deepest condolences to the family and friends of the victims. As many of you know, there was a double homicide that occurred in the city of Pembroke with a third person with life-threatening injuries. The detachment commander has had ongoing communication with myself as the mayor and chair of the PSB. And the OPP issued a press release late May 22nd with a further one on May 23rd and another one on May 26th. As head of council, I did issue a press release May 23rd. I have had communication with CBC, CTV, City News, Radio Canada. It always amazes me that uh, the different newscasts like to uh, prey on bad news. But in any event, uh, they, uh, we did... Uh, I did speak to them uh, to address uh, some of their, uh, their questions and um, some of their comments or questions related to how is the public addressing it. Um, certainly I've been in touch with Mayor Sidney and will continue to do so. He's one of the mayors that uh, the CAO references earlier this evening in terms of uh, a road show is getting to know the different mayors and CAOs to develop a relationship uh, so that when things happen like this uh, that we can uh, uh, pick up the phone, have a conversation and it's not the first time we've ever spoken to each other. Um, as noted in the OPP release, the investigators believe that it was a targeted situation. 
Um, and as we know, due to the due diligence, and I want to give credit to Inspector Newfield, the UOV Crime Unit, OPP Forensic Identification Unit, Criminal Investigation Branch, the Office of the Chief Coroner, and the OPP as a, as a whole team um, for all of their work and for making the arrest on May 30th. The investigation is ongoing, and despite certain questions from media, they will not release anything further at this time so as to not uh, impede that investigation. I do expect that there's going to be a further OPP release uh, as this unfolds. Uh, I want to assure the public that this is an anomaly, that we are a safe community, uh, but if there uh, is individuals, residents, and some have reached out to me, and I'm sure they've reached out to yourself as well, to encourage them to contact services such as the Mental Health Crisis Line and to avail themselves of the, uh, the supports that we do have available. So on that serious note, I want to conclude by again staying, saying, as I always do, stay safe and be kind to one another. Are there any notices of motion this evening? Seeing none, are there any councillor updates? Councillor Lafreniere? So last night, I had the pleasure of hosting the City of Pembroke Civic and Youth Awards celebration. And I first off want to thank councillors and the mayor for sponsoring the event. Uh, it went off without a hitch almost, except I forgot to introduce the mayor, so that's okay. He didn't care, it's okay. And I called uh, Pure Country Star 96, so that was my second boo-boo. But uh, other than that, it was, it was a great evening. I think all the recipients had a great time, and it was just nice to get out and mingle in a nice environment. And uh, Councillor Keel was there. Uh, of course, Councillor Jackton was there. Um, I want to thank you again, and I can't look. I, I can't wait till next year because I'm sure there's even going to be more nominations. You know, the the sleepiness of COVID is coming off. You know, and people are starting to come out, and we got to get them stimulated again. So I want to thank all the volunteers out there and to keep up the good work. Um, also, um, there was the Jim Sloan Memorial. Uh, tournament took place and I just want to say it went off great there was lots of teams registered and uh, all proceeds for that event go to the Pembroke Boys and Girls Club uh, as everyone anyone who knew Jim personally he was on the board of directors for many years I sat with him for many years and he had a love for the vulnerable youth in our community and even as a police officer he always had a soft heart for them so uh, not that I had that kind of interaction with him but uh, anyway that's my report thank you Thank you. Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a couple little reports. Uh, this one deals with the uh, Renfrew County Housing Authority and community services that uh, I have the opportunity to attend as your representative. Just some stats. The housing registry wait list at present stands at 1,355 individuals looking for a place to live. Uh, most of the demand is for one-bedroom units. Uh, rents have skyrocketed, to home displacements, demand for real estate has increased. Uh, as you'll see in our community, soul signs everywhere you look. A building is listed uh, very shortly and it's, uh, it's consequently sold. Uh, Bill 23 again alleviates, uh, de alleviates the demand uh, by allowing more development on R1, R2 zoning uh, designations. So hopefully that'll help in the future. Uh, funding for the homelessness, uh, provincially there was an announcement that the funding has doubled, so it has gone from $1,785,000 to $3,569,000,000 over the next two years. So before you get too excited about everybody having a place to live in the homelessness situation, a lot of that funding is going to go to supplement the following. Uh, strong communities rent supplement programs rent allowance programs, emergency minor home repairs, emergency housing assistance, and also to pay for the increase in casework, uh, caseworker workload. So it will go directly and indirectly to the homeless. As well, Your Worship, I just want to bring attention to uh, the mural committee. Uh, Carol Marwa, who is the artist that did the mural at the museum, uh, is uh, reconstructing some of the damaged panels and uh, she's been doing it indoors and thanks to Mike Devine for providing uh, his facility at 169 Lake Street. Uh, can you imagine working outside in this type of uh, environment to try and bring some murals back to 
uh, back to the original stature or in the rain. So uh, there's 40 panels that are being reconstructed, repainted from the original artist's work and they should be up by the end of June. As well, Your Worship, uh, this Saturday pass, I had the opportunity to represent you at the 67th Annual Ceremonial Review of the Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron from Pembroke. Uh, the reviewing officer, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Harris, is the commanding officer of 450 Tactical Helicopter Squadron. Uh, he has a varied uh, career. Uh, he's been all over the place, and actually, in our uh, short discussion after the parade, it was ironic that I was in Kosovo when he was there. He was a young flight lieutenant flying uh, Puma helicopters for the RAF, and I was there on a municipal tour, uh, having representing uh, city council over there for two weeks visiting the troops. Uh, Colonel Harris, Lieutenant Colonel Harris, rather, has had various uh, engagements in Iraq, at Basra, Baghdad, as well as in Afghanistan and Kosovo. Uh, he indicated and he spoke well to these young people. There were 60 of them on parade. All turned out uh, just wonderfully, uh, sharply dressed. And the Air Cadets, uh, what they do is probably one of the best kept secrets in the country, is they promote good citizenship. And they also promote aviation. So he encouraged each of those young fellows and young, young girls. And he spoke to many of them. And I mean, he was so personable. Uh, and he wanted to, uh, to express how important it was for you know, a person of his particular capabilities who started in a very small role in a very similar environment in, in Great Britain that he became you know, the commanding officer of, uh, of a Chinook helicopter squadron. And he would encourage all the young people to follow their dreams and not to give up. As well, the, uh, we were entertained by the two Canadian mechanized brigade group Pipes and Drums uh, during the parade. And I must congratulate them. I mean, it's a nice Saturday afternoon, and who in their right mind, you know, would want to come and stay in a, in a stuffy hangar and with a bunch of young people? They did, because it was important to them. So, Your Worship, I, I did uh, send your uh, greetings on behalf of, uh, of uh, yourself and our council. And I just want to say that uh, it was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jackano. Okay, seeing, oh, Deputy Mayor. Just a few items, Your Worship. On behalf of uh, Mayor Gervais and I, we want to thank everyone who purchased a rain barrel this year. We get $10 a barrel. Um, we reached our goal of 100. And this year we sold four of the 1,000 liter tanks, which we get $40 for. And we're seeing some repeat customers also. Um, these rain barrels are made of recycled food products, so they don't go in the land disposal. They come back to get recycled in the rain barrel. So we raised $1,100, and the money goes towards the expenses for the community garden, such as uh, purchasing more garden beds, which we did the other day, and uh, any miscellaneous stuff for hoses and spray guns and seeds that we need for the food bank garden. Uh, we want to thank uh, two special people, Nain and Tulu. Uh, two uh, international students, um, Nayin is from Jamaica and Tulo from uh, Nigeria. Nigeria. And uh, Nayin helped us, helped the uh, mayor and I on the Friday night unload the rain barrels. And then uh, they both showed up on Saturday. I went and picked them up and they helped us uh, the whole day. And uh, lo and behold, Councillor Jackano also came to assist for a few hours as he does. And he didn't need to bring his drill this time. So we thank you for that. Uh, the food bank gardens were planted on the weekend. We had a handful of volunteers. We want to thank them. Um, so we have the large garden plot. And we have three garden beds for the food bank, uh, St. Joseph's Food Bank. We want to uh, put a shout out to Ruth Molnar, who has led the planting and the food bank garden for the last few years. She will be stepping down after she's done overseeing the watering and that. But she will still uh, be training uh, a new uh, garden member on picking and handing over the food and the routine with Rene Lachapelle weekly for the food bank. And we want to thank her and Sister Colette Larma, who is one of the original gardeners, and Jasmine Shervin and her partner, who uh, always volunteer with us there. 
Uh, we want to thank everyone who donated plants. The, the mayor uh, received a donation from a local nursery. We want to thank them. Uh, on behalf of uh, Councillor Jackano and I, committee cleanup is supposed to be this Saturday. It will be dependent upon the weather. Uh, meet at the farmer's market at 9 till noon. We provide bags and gloves. And the rumor has it that uh, the mayor will buy uh, coffee and Timbits for everybody, as he always does. Um, the Pembroke Youth Council, our second meeting is next Tuesday. We had to change the date to next Tuesday at 5 o'clock in the library boardroom. Um, the first meeting went very well. There's a news release in, this, in uh, the Observer. Uh, the second meeting will be like the first one, more of a discussion on the community, and then we will get rolling in September. We've got to reach out more to the schools and get the youth involved. But we had quite a few youth at the first, first one. Jamie Brandberger from the college is there, and uh, Megan from the Youth Hub. And you can contact myself or Councillor Frenier for more information. Um, the library, on behalf of Councillor Purcell and I, are having a um, multi licious promotion. Uh, local restaurants, it's on their website and Facebook page. Every restaurant has a specific dish, and you can go and try that dish. It's on a certain day of the week, or it could be constant, up until uh, July 15th. The purpose of the multi licious campaign is a prelude to the uh, July Multicultural Festival. Uh, the TD Summer Reading Program starts on Saturday, uh, June 10th, and registration is up until the 26th of June. So get your children, children, uh, get your kids reading in the summer. I got an update about uh, Fred from Fred Blackstein that um, we can report on at the next meeting, Councillor Keel and I. There's lots of stuff going on at the Arboretum, uh, stuff getting improvements. I won't give out the details because uh, we want to see if the public will notice once all this smoke clears and enjoy the waterfront. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, busy couple weeks. Uh, Festival Hall Consortium met on May 19th. Um, things, are, things are going very well uh, at Festival Hall. We certainly have lots of events. Um, I know there has been some disappointment. There was one cancelled show uh, um, due to some uh, some plumbing issues and whatnot in the building. Um, but everyone uh, everyone should know that those are being addressed, and, uh, and our own CAO actually has, has been keeping on top of those uh, very well. And uh, I think his last report was quite uh, was quite positive. Um, on June second, I was uh, up at CNL for the day. Uh, it was County Day uh, for elected officials. Um, had a wonderful opportunity uh, not only to uh, to meet some uh, some others uh, from outside of Pembroke, um, but to tour what is truly a a gem in our in our local county. Um, uh, CNL at this point is uh, is spending billions of dollars refurbishing. Uh, um, they've knocked down over a hundred buildings. They're building some new uh, state of the art facilities. Uh, we were. Uh, uh, we discussed uh, some of the, I guess, forging ventures in terms of cancer treatments and whatnot uh, uh, that CNL is being a part of. Um, but most importantly, um, I got to meet a robot dog, and uh, I think for uh, for all for all guys, that just made the day. <laughs> Wendy Hewitt and I from Lawrence. use in bylaw enforcement. I certainly think it would uh, it would scare the person that it's on June second the mayor mentioned um, June fourth um, I will say that I and uh, and Bailey did very I also want to mention that uh, yesterday was the um, it has certainly been uh, both a long 10 years and also a short um, 10 years um, seeing thousands of local residents um, and uh, as vice chair of the Robbie Dean Center um, I did uh, put myself to work this weekend um, and hosted a charity slow pitch tournament uh, up in Petawawa 
I'm happy to announce uh, that we raised $2,700, but I also completely lost my voice in the process. Um, I assure you it is, uh, it is because of how dusty and dry the fields were. It is not because I need to uh, constantly raise my voice. Um, I thank all of the participants and everybody that showed up for that. And uh, uh, 10th anniversary events will continue for the Robbie Dean Center. We have one event at least every month and I certainly encourage uh, residents to take advantage of that. And then with respect to my regular festival hall update, I can tell you that on June 23rd, CDE Dance Academy presents Take More Chances, Learn More Dances at our very own festival hall. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Any other updates? Okay, uh, <laughs> Councillor Purcell, uh, moving into closed session. You have a motion. Um, <clears throat> moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Keel that this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss proposed acquisition or disposition of land known as 252-270 uh, Pembroke Street West by the Municipality of Local Board under Section 239-2C of the Municipal Act and also labour negotiations or employee negotiations regarding the Pembroke Fire Department under Section 239-2D of the Municipal Act. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Unruh. I move by Councillor Purcell and seconded by Councillor Keel that we move into a closed <coughs> meeting to discuss first a proposed acquisition or disposition of land known as 252-270 Pembroke Street West Municipal or Local Board Section 239 Sub 2 Sub C Municipal Act and secondly Labour Negotiations, Employee Negotiations regarding our Pembroke Fire Department, Section 239, 2D, Municipal Act. Those in favor, that's carried. We'll now move into a closed session.